Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 25th meeting of 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as the interview of broadcasting? Even when they're switched to silent, there are no apologies. We read item one in the agenda, subordinate legislation. This is the formal debate. Members will recall that we agreed to postpone the formal debate and the motion to approve the affirmative instrument on legal aid after evidence taking last week. I therefore welcome once again Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs. I also welcome the Justice Department officials who are here to support the Minister, but to remind everyone that they're not going to take part in this. It's not an evidence session, it's a debate. I invite the Minister, first of all, to move and speak to motion S4M14088 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Legal Aid and Advice Assistance Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2015 draft be approved. Minister, I'll ask you to move and then to speak in the debate. Thank you, Convener. I, I formally move the, the motion. Um, I'm grateful to the Committee for allowing further time to consider legal aid arrangements for the new Sheriff Appeal Court. Um, my officials met with the Law Society representatives last week. Uh, to reassure them of the government's commitment to continue to engage with them on this important issue. And following that discussion, uh, I remain of the view that these regulations make appropriate legal aid provision until a review of how the court is operating can be undertaken early in the new year. As shown in the example account shared with the society, and I'm aware that there is some criticism and I hope to be able to address that, uh, convener, um, but as shown in the example accounts shared with the society and with the committee, appropriate fees will be available to solicitors conducting appeals in the Sheriff Appeal Court through the detailed fee arrangements. Scottish Legal Aid Board estimates that a Glasgow solicitor could earn fees and outlays of anything from £400 to £600 and more. The example account in the committee papers uh, does indeed demonstrate how a fee of £606.77 is arrived at in a hypothetical appeal against conviction. Um, but as I say, I'm aware that uh, the Society of Solicitor Advocates have uh, been critical of some of the numbers. But if representing a client from the original defence of the case through to appeal at the Sheriff Appeal Court, a solicitor could be paid more than £900 per client. It's important to emphasise that the payments for the new appeal court are calculated on a different basis from the block fee currently paid to counsel conducting an appeal in the High Court. That fee does not make detailed provision for travel and other expenses. The detailed fees proposed for the new court will allow for a proper assessment to be made of the work undertaken by individual solicitors in each case. This is not the end of the process, though, and as I say, we will continue to engage with the profession to review the fee arrangements for the new court and the legal aid system more widely. And indeed, the data that we would develop through using detailed fee arrangements would allow us to assess in due course whether there was a case for block fees to be, uh, to be applied for the Sheriff Appeal Court. So the, the information that solicitors will be providing will help inform that process. And I know members raised concerns about the cost of travel to the new court, uh, in particular Mr Finney raised an example which I hope we've tried to address in providing information to the committee for this week's session. I can assure members that travel fees will continue to be available and solicitors will not be disadvantaged relative to the current arrangements. Uh, the, the travel fee uh, arrangements are effectively similar to, to those already in place uh, for solicitors attending uh, court in Edinburgh. However, solicitors will often choose to instruct an agent in Edinburgh for these types of appeals as they do at the moment, and that's important to stress, rather than travel. The Scottish Legal Aid Board will be taking a pragmatic and flexible approach to sanction for counsel, uh, which will help solicitors make the transition to the new Sheriff Appeal Court. And it is evident that solicitors do not want to take on uh, this work in the immediate term, and SLAB has indicated it will sanction counsel for cases in, new, in the new court. We are considering, convener, whether it would be possible uh, in due course, um, uh, using accelerated process, to amend the regulations to allow uh, for uh, effectively a guarantee that sanction for accounts will be given in cases to remove the doubt for solicitors who are currently, uh, uh, as I understand it from the discussions of the Law Society, concerned that there may be a risk if they take on a case uh, and then aren't able to represent that client in the Sheriff Appeal Court. So hopefully that would remove that doubt from a solicitor's minds. And this will make sure, therefore, if a solicitor chooses not to appear in the new court, there will be no worse off at present. And importantly, the client will be represented. Uh, we can uh, be sure that uh, equality of arms will be given. But solicitor advocates, as we discussed last week, will not be able to charge council rates in the Sheriff Appeal Court, but will have the option to provide representation in their capacity as solicitors. Uh, I, re I understand that's not ideal from a solicitor advocate perspective. But this reflects the existing legal aid situation for civil sheriff appeals and other proceedings in the lower courts, where solicitor advocates do not exercise their extended rights of audience. And we've already begun discussions with the Law Society, the Society of Solicitor Advocates and the Faculty of Advocates on the role of solicitor advocates in comparison to counsel with a view to addressing these wider issues. And I put on record I have uh, the utmost regard for solicitor advocates and, and, and the work they do. 
Um, I undertake to meet personally with the representatives of solicitor advocates in the near future to discuss these issues from their perspective, well ahead of the legal aid arrangements for the new Sheriff Appeal Court being reviewed. And I hope that my letter uh, and the further clarification provided today will enable the committee to support this instrument, allow the new Sheriff Appeal Court to begin its work. And uh, I just stress uh, as well, I, I mentioned these figures last week, but given the, the nature of the discussion we had, I just want to make sure that they register that we are talking about a situation where the cases involved are less than 1% of all of those uh, granted uh, support by the Scottish Legal Aid Board. We have uh, around 30 solicitor advocates who uh, are doing work of this nature, uh, who may be affected by the measures, but only half a dozen, six, who are doing more than £5,000 worth of fees in the, in the last year for which uh, Scottish Legal Aid Board have data. So I hope that puts in perspective the scale of, of potential impact on individual businesses and the number of individuals involved. But that, for those individuals, I appreciate those are serious issues, and we, uh, hence the commitment to meet with the Society of Solicitor Advocates to discuss that issue. Um, but I uh, hope, convener, that helps clarify the position somewhat, but I'm happy to, to engage in the debate. Uh, members, I've got Rod's just indicated, Elaine, uh, Alison, and uh, Margaret, and Christian. Rod, do you want to make a declaration of interest first, I think, for your start? <laughs> thank, thank you for reminding me. Just in case can you I, get sued. Yeah, can I mind refer, you, who'd be mind? No. <laughs> on you go. Can I refer to my declaration of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, in that context, Minister, could I just... Uh, direct you to the, the question of the, the impact of sanction for counsel. My colleague Margaret Mitchell last week referred to a section which only obviously applies to civil proceedings. Um, obviously I'm grateful for your comments about uh, further discussions on extended rights of audience but is there anything further you can say in terms of the impact of sanction for counsel in terms of these particular uh, types of proceedings at the present time? Um, I'm just... Uh Conscious if, if Mr. Campbell can remind me of the, the point that, uh, that um, was made by uh, Margaret, Margaret Mitchell last Mitchell week. Margaret Mitchell referred to Section 108 of the Courts Reform Act, sanctioned for counsel in the Sheriff Court. It, it, but obviously that only applies to civil proceedings. That gives uh, the court the, 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 basically the power to decide whether sanction for counsel is appropriate. But in, obviously that's not relevant to uh, criminal legal aid. Indeed, I mean we, we, are, we are conscious that we're, we're trying to ensure that the, um, uh, the provisions uh, ensure equality of arms. I, I do take very seriously the point that uh, Margaret Mitchell made last week, and I hope um, that in uh, the evidence that we present in the letter uh, submitted to the committee, we have addressed a large number of the areas that, that were uh, raised last week and as concerns. Clearly, we um, uh, we will see. Uh, a number of areas where perhaps we need to review the performance of the court in practice. I think the, the issue around the, the regulations as they are proposed is that um, in requiring uh, solicitors to provide information, detailed fees, we will be able to build up a, a, a knowledge of the costs um, of, of taking forward a case, to be able to uh, look uh, sympathetically at the need for um, block fees and, and other arrangements in future to assist solicitors and reduce the, the bureaucracy involved in um, drawing down legal aid where solicitors and solicitor advocates and counsel are doing um, obviously the, the appropriate work on behalf of their clients. We don't want to create unnecessary bureaucracy if that can be avoided. Um, but uh, Section 108 is about whether the cost of counsel can be uh, recovered from the unsuccessful party in civil litigation and um, we can uh, obviously uh, come back to the committee on that in due course but it's not uh, entirely relevant to the point that's being debated in terms of the regulations as proposed. Okay. Um, the, the second point, just uh, away from sanction for council, is just on the question of the, uh, the 260,000 um, savings that the Law Society had predicated by alternative fee arrangements. Um, in your letter to the committee, you, you said it's, it's unclear how such savings could be achieved from the options proposed. Is there anything? Just to remind people, this is not an evidence session, it's a oh, debate. Right. Um, I'm yeah. No, it's all right. I mean, I'm yeah. quite flexible about it, but I, I think to remind you that yeah. the format's more of a debate, so yeah. a little speech from you rather than that. Um, but if you raise things, then the Minister will answer them, we hope, in the winding <coughs> up. So do you wish to just well, say uh, it in a different uh, way, uh, perhaps? Yeah, no, I, I can say, as far as the 260,000, as far as the committee is concerned, it's, it's really, w w with the best will in the world, there is an insufficient information presented to us to take a view on, on that alternative proposal. Yeah. 
My approach to this is not that this debate really is not so much about what solicitors are paid or what solicitor advocates are paid, but the essential thing is access to justice for people on low incomes. And my concern is that if solicitors will not perform these duties on the fees they receive from the Legal Aid Board, and if people are not able to get a solicitor advocate to represent them in the Sheriff Appeal Court, if they are uh, supported by Legal Aid, that they will not get the same access to justice as a person who is able to pay, who will be able to pay the private fee charged by the solicitor or the private fee charged by the solicitor advocate. And that means that a person on low income will be disadvantaged. In this essence, legal aid is a benefit to people on low incomes. Uh, it is paid to help them to pay for their legal costs. Uh, and cutting in that budget is actually a cut and a benefit to people on low income. Uh, and that, that is my main concern, and I, that concern has not been allayed, I, I'm afraid, in the last week by the information we've got, because I am not convinced that solicitors will continue to do this work or that solicitor advocates will be prepared to do the sort, the sort of work that they did uh, for the fees that they get uh, from the, the Scottish Legal Aid Board. Uh, so that is my main concern, and unless that concern can be allayed today, then it is my consideration that I will have to oppose this particular instrument. Now, I know that there is a certain amount of uh, time pressure with regard to this, but the government has had a long time to think about it. It's only been in front of the committee for a week, but the government has had quite a long time to consider this and to get this right, and I'm not convinced that you have got it right. Uh, I, my question, if the minister could maybe uh, respond in his summing up, uh, is that... Um, in, on page 37 of the papers we've got, which is a letter from the Minister, there is a, a suggestion that the unintended effect of, uh, of not passing this would be that solicitors would be worse off for representing the client in the original defence of the case. Now, I don't understand that argument at all, so I would be interested in uh, the rationale behind the statement that's in the letter. Thanks, Thanks Elaine. Um, Alison, followed by Margaret, Ma Margaret Mitchell. Thank you very much. Can I first of all draw committee's attention to my register of interest? I'm a member of Justice Scotland. Um, the Minister's chosen to characterise the debate as an issue of fees for the, the legal profession, and I think quite inappropriately last week he cited comparison with the minimum wage. Um, we don't pay legal aid for the good of, of, of the legal profession. We pay it, as Elaine Murray has said, as a public benefit to secure access to justice. Um, the Minister said that legal aid fees are, are reasonable rates of pay for the work involved, but clearly in this instance that is not the case, and we've had um, significant amounts of correspondence um, challenging the figures that the Minister has said. This is a new court. There's been ample time to consider this, and it's really not our place to avoid scrutiny um, because the Minister has left it all to the last minute. The court reforms are about streamlining and modernising and weren't, I think, themselves meant to be a cost-saving exercise, and yet what we seem to be getting on the coattails is that. I think I would stress that the appeals will be no less demanding than they were before, and they will be just as important to the appellant, and yet we're facing appellants with an inequality of arms. Um, we've heard that advocate deputies will be um, making the case we might have people with no representation whatsoever, given the tight timescales. I think this is hasty and ill thought out, and I will not support this uh, order today. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Christian, please. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, I'm grateful you've come back with um, extra information and, and tried to um, provide some clarity. And unfortunately, I don't think you've succeeded. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, given the representations we've had and the very valid points that seem to be coming um, forward from those affected by these regulations, for example, the, the contingency, I think that that's an accurate description of, of what you're now proposing, uh, the, 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 tra the, the contingency the contingency and transitional arrangements lead to a bit of uncertainty in, in themselves, and that's not good for the establishment of the new court. And while it might only be 1% of all the cases, 38 solicitor advocates, that's still access to justice issues for every individual that might be looking for representation from these solicitor advocates. Um, also, there seems to be some dubiety about the um, five accounts of expenses that were drafted for different scenarios. They're being challenged. And there was some real concern that if solicitors did take on some of this work in the appeal court, and you referred to that today, um, 
and then found that they were on court duty or, or they had some other local commitments, they might be in contempt of court. Now, you've covered that in your opening statement, but that wasn't covered last week. You could easily have passed that last week. So my question is, how many other things are there, there which could affect um, access to, judge, um, to justice? Because we've already had um, both the, solicitor of, of sol the, the Society of Solicitors and Procurators of Stirling and Falkirk and District Faculty of Solicitors advise that they wouldn't be taking on any appeal courts. And, and that opinion has been monitored, I think, from the, the Law Society representation too. And there's very many, I think, quite legitimate points that have been raised from the solicitor advocates. So one way or another, Minister, I think the wisest thing would be not to pass this today and perhaps to, to have a fuller debate and more clarity if it goes to chamber. Christian, followed by John. Thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, Minister. Thank you very much for your opening statement. And, uh, and like Margaret said, I think it's quite welcoming that you tackle more points uh, before. And thanks very much as well to give us some level of fees. Uh, and uh, we do understand now that the, the level of fees are quite different of what the submission we received. I have no declaration of interest to make uh, because I've ne never been working in the profession. But I do understand when a profession is trying to defend this level of fees, they will make a strong argument for, for it. Uh, one thing who convinced me to vote uh, 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 with the government on, on, on this one is what you said about the six months. I think it's quite important to have a review in six month time. And I'm very, very encouraged by the fact that you will keep uh, the, um, the communication with, uh, with uh, everybody in the profession uh, during the six months. So everything you can tell us about this is, is very, very welcome. And uh, I, 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 I will wish that uh, some of the submissions we receive will not try to compare apples and pears. I think it's quite important uh, to understand where the fees are. And it's quite important as well, another point, Convener, which uh, we really have to, uh, to point out is regarding the travelling. Uh, uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in the profession interest to instruct somebody in the borough to, 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 to represent them. So I, I do feel that all the submissions we have received are very, very welcome, but they were very, very similar. And, and, and to a certain extent, I do understand why they were made. And uh, I'm quite encouraged with the six-month review and with the engagement with the government will make in the, in the six-month period. So I will uh, vote uh, with the government on this one. Thank you. Um, John, please, for by Mark McDougall. Uh, morning, Minister. Um, the equality arms issue has been mentioned on a number of occasions. I think that's very important because, to me, it is about status and it is about the, the relative positions of the, 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 the Crown and those actually sitting, deliberating. And what's important matters are about findings um, and, and also sentence. I, I think the frailty, as I see it, Minister, relates to communication here because I would have found this compe far more compelling if this had been six months before we were actually considering this rather than six months after. There's lots of very positive phrases you said, if I noted you correctly. In due course, in the near future, you're assured us that SLAB would be pragmatic. You talked about accelerating amendments. But basically, this is because um, of the reform which we were involved in passing. Um, it's changed the title. It's probably not even changing the location. But there is, you know, I don't think the purpose of this committee is to... Um, uh, negotiate fees on behalf of any profession, but we have to protect the interests um, of workers regardless of what status they have and how competent they may be themselves. And the idea that because we change the title and, uh, and forum that someone suddenly um, is disadvantaged seems to me to be uh, entirely wrong. And indeed, the fact that one of that profession refers to competition law and the exclusion from that, I think, is a very interesting um, uh, development. But uh, my obligation is to uh, represent what's in the best interest of uh, my constituents. And I've been left in no doubt by the Faculty of Solicitors of the Highlands, and this would be compounded by the Highland uh, Courts. Um, and they say, and I, I'll just read it, I have canvassed the views of the legal practices working in your constituency who regularly undertake criminal court work and can report that none is prepared to accept instructions from legal-aided clients in respect of summary appeal cases with effect on 22nd September 2015. Now, I think I said last week the phrase access to justice is bandied about all the time. That is not access to justice for my constituents. 
I'm disappointed that the priority, the work that's going to take place after we've discussed this, didn't take place beforehand. I, I can't support this uh, proposal in front of us. Thank you. I add my concerns around access to justice to what has already been set out by my colleagues on the committee. Nothing has convinced me since last week um, to change my mind around this. Uh, I've got concerns that people will not be able to get a solicitor of choice uh, because not every solicitor will be willing to, to come forward and offer their services for that. Um, also, you mentioned you know, that you will review this at a later date, the fees. So my concern as well is around what will happen to appellants who have not appealed in that time or have lost that opportunity because they couldn't get a solicitor because the solicitor wasn't available or they, they didn't find it financially viable to do so. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, I find and this very difficult. The jury's still out for me about this, I have to say. My concern is also access uh, to justice um, for whoever you are. I mean, one of the main things has been throughout the legislation we've looked at is equality of arms. Um, I understand that the Sheriff Court the appeal will be up and running the 22nd of September and the main thrust uh, for the urgency I hear from the Cabinet Secretary is that, and perhaps in his summing up he will advise this, is the, uh, again raised by someone else, is that the, if we don't bring this in then solicitors will be worse off. Now I, I need to have a working example um, of that. It says consequently this would have the intended effect leaving many solicitors, well not all but many, so I want to know what that is, worse off for representing the client in the original defence of the case. So I need to know why if we don't do this it will be worse than if we do it and wait for a review. The, second, the other point I, I want to make in the debate is the, something, and I, I sort of skimmed past me, is the role of SLAB here. Obviously, I want to know how firm the commitment of SLAB would be, given that I think you said we're only about 30 practicing solicitor advocates, to move to our automatic, how sympathetic you are, and bringing in automatic sanction for solicitor advocates, um, in, uh, advocates and solicitor advocates in the appeal court, so that we get rid of this problem of the differential. So there's quite a few things in there for me, and, and I think the main thing is to leave it, if we don't do this, and it's up and running the 22nd of September, why are solicitors going to be worse off? Uh, that's the main thing at the moment. Otherwise, I have concerns, like everybody else, that we're sort of sorting things out if we do this after the legislation's passed. You know, um, I will hopefully be able to try and address all of the, the points that have been raised by, by members, and I thank members for their uh, considered points. Um, clearly, this is uh, you know, uh, an issue which has um, gathered significance as time has, has gone on. I believe when the, the committee uh, scrutinised the, the uh, original uh, Act, the Court Reform uh, Act, uh, th these issues perhaps didn't come up, they weren't raised at the time in terms of being a, a point where there was concern, and clearly the committee... Um, uh, and, and Parliament indeed has supported the creation of the Sheriff Appeal Court and now we are in a position where I appreciate the committee is in some difficulty trying to understand what the implications will be for uh, access to justice which I fully recognise a number of members have made. But on access to justice, can I, can I firstly say that um, uh, we, are, we are absolutely committed to ensuring that individuals are represented and represented well uh, when it comes to an appeal. And clearly while there is a specific issue to address in terms of solicitor advocates, and I recognise that issue and I've, um, I've tried to express my sympathy for the need to address that issue in the long term. Uh, we have a position where if a solicitor is unwilling to take forward a case to the Sheriff Appeal Court, uh, or if indeed there's a concern about equality of arms, we can, as I say, amend the regulations in an accelerated process. I can't give a timescale because obviously we need to work with the committee about when that would be possible to do that. But we uh, can bring forward accelerated changes to uh, the regulations to ensure that uh, sanction for counsel is guaranteed um, for, for clients. So that removes the, the risk from a solicitor's point of view if they're taking on a case that there may be an inequality of arms for the client and a concern that they may not be able to represent them uh, to the appropriate uh, level in uh, a Sheriff Appeal Court. So we are uh, uh, you know, making that statement today. That falls from the, the discussions we've had with the Law Society in the last week since we last met. Uh, and indeed, you know, points were raised uh, at that meeting which we have recognised and felt the need to address. So I hope that we are 
reacting positively to the engagement we've had with law society and ensuring that equality of arms is guaranteed. Now, that doesn't deal with the issue of the solicitor advocates that the convener has raised, and I think it's a fair one. I, I certainly want to put on, on record my own uh, recognition of the quality of work that is done by solicitor advocates, and I'm no way critical of, of, of their function. I know they have done a lot of good work in, uh, under the current arrangements, and so we need to try and address the uh, position that there is. There are, of course, as the committee will be aware, much bigger uh, debates about the role of solicitor advocates and a number of stakeholders, and we are, as I say, trying to engage with the Law Society already, the Solicitor Society of Solicitor Advocates, and indeed the Faculty of Advocates to ensure that we address that uh, and to get uh, a fair, a fair uh, settlement, if you like, for uh, the uh, compensation for solicitor advocates for the work they do for their clients. Um, that is not going to be a, a quick process. I believe there's a a good bit of debate to be had between the different parties and, and the government. And to some extent, we're, uh, we're trying to uh, marshal uh, all three groups to come to a reasonable position. Um, so I do recognise the point the convener has made, and I just want to put, I appreciate I can't address it today, but I certainly do give the committee my, my assurance that that's something that we will be taking forward. In terms of the um, access to justice point uh, more generally, um, I do... How, um, do we, how they'll be worse off. Oh, if certainly. We don't pass um, this. That's, and that's a, kind of key to anything. Yes, indeed. Is if, there's, if they're going to be worse off, and therefore there's going to be fewer people representing them, that's an issue. Yep. And you haven't addressed that. Well, ha happily, Convener, I was coming to that point. I mean, clearly, the, the, the uh, Chef Appeal Court has been created. It will be up and running on the 22nd of September, regardless of what we decide today. Um, but the, in terms of the, the position being worse off for solicitors, most uh, summary criminal work is already paid as a block fee, and so this is perhaps where some of the problems ar arise in terms of the comparison between what we're proposing and what uh, already pertains to be the case. But some cases will involve more work than others, so the block fee is intended to offer a fair remuneration across the piece. Um, and you know, solicitors may all be doing uh, cases of differing complexity, and therefore, in some cases, they may actually benefit from the block fee. In other cases, it perhaps are, are, uh, it's, a, it's more of a loss, a loss leader because they're, they're picking up other cases where they do uh, get more for the, for the work than they, they actually would charge on a detailed fee basis. But the regulations would make um, uh, the appeal uh, distinct proceedings, and with a separate grant of legal aid, the solicitor would receive the block fee for the original proceedings plus detailed fees for the appeal. So they would get the existing block fee, but also... Do and what working example? Um, well, I, I, I think the, the key issue is if you've, if you've got um, uh, uh, app war or um, uh, proceedings, that, that, that potentially solicitors would be worse off. But without the regulations, solicitor will only be paid detailed fees for the whole case. Uh, and this will sometimes mean, clearly, if they are charging a detailed fee because of the absence of the block fee, in cases where they perhaps would have benefited from a block fee, they'll be getting less now than they would have done. But for those solicitors who are doing more work than the block fee would have covered, they'll be getting uh, paid uh, accurately, if you like, for the work. So in some cases, solicitors may get less than they currently do because the block fee overcompensates them for the I'm work. I feel I'm, I'm in Sir Humphrey mode now. <laughs> I'm trying to untangle it's difficult, that. It's difficult. Some will be better off and some will be worse off, is what you're saying. I, indeed, because the block fee recognises that some cases are less complex and some are more complex. I understand block so, fees. Yep. So I hope the, 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 the Does anybody else want to ask something just to, to clarify this? If, can I you, mean, can do yes. this in debate. You can just... Can, you're yeah. intervening. You're yes, intervening. Yeah, yeah. Mean, right. Yes, it's... it's the second paragraph of, of the, the, par the, the section on implications says, since the first instance work usually played in a, blo a block as well as the appeal would have to be assessed on a detailed fee basis. Why? Because that's not the same as arguments you're presenting to us at the moment. You're presenting an argument about the block fee yeah. might not cover all the work you're we doing and so that. on, which we it's understand. Average, yeah. But what I simply cannot understand is if we, if we don't pass this, if we, if we don't change the instruments, that somehow that affects other work which is normally played in a block. I just cannot get that at all. Um, uh, at the moment, we have obviously no regulations that deal specifically with the Sheriff Appeal Court. So we have no uh, regime in place, if you like, to determine fees for the Sheriff Appeal Court because it's, it's a new vehicle, it's a new jurisdiction. Um, so in the absence of regulations, if they are not passed today, we will have to revert to ca calculating what the cost is from a legal aid perspective on a detailed fee basis. So there will be no. So there will be a mixture of the block fee for the original casework, which is taken forward, and, and the detail fees, which would be charged for the uh, the work thereafter. Um, in terms of the uh, the uh, block provision, why that falls? If I could just consult with my colleague, um, convener. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, because they're not going to be distinct proceedings. So it's all yeah, it's all one. Okay, so, yeah. so it's got to be either the block fee or okay. I'll, 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 um, yeah, sorry, I misunderstood the point that was made to me, to me earlier, but uh, because they, they are not distinct proceedings for legal aid, they would all be one account, so they would all be assessed as detailed fees rather than the block and detailed together. So that's incorrect, what well, I just informed Elaine Murray. Apologies, convener. Yeah. But they, uh, the point is they would ha all have to be assessed on the same basis, so you would lose the ability to, to, to pay the block fee uh, for that part of the case prior to the appeal, and they would all be assessed on a detailed fee basis. I have to say, I'm, I'm sorry, but how do you then know they'll be worse off? Um, because I don't know how you'll know they'll be worse off. Convener, the, 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 the block fee arrangement was put in place based on a detail. I know about block that, fees. That currently overcompensates some solicitors for the work they do in the court because the block fee is higher than uh -huh. the amount that would be charged on a detailed fee basis. We know that because it was based on the average uh -huh. across uh, cases of that kind. If there are some cases which are more complex, they will perhaps solicitor might be better off by charging detailed fees. But for those solicitors who are perhaps benefiting from a block fee now for a less complex case, they will get less through detailed fees than they would through the block fee. I hope that clarifies that point. It depends um, on the case, actually. It depends on the nature of the case, Gilles, yes, absolutely. Yes. The convener, is it in the cost, not in the actual fee, but in the administration of the work that's been done? Is that where the costs are? Sorry. Bear with me a perhaps ask Mr. Bear with Patterson to repeat that. Yes, that, that's correct. I don't know what you said, but it sounded correct. <laughs> uh, I think you've got to come to me, and the minister's got to agree whether or not take an intervention. Yeah, well, I'm sure, minister, you would I'd comply. I'd be happy to take an intervention. Yes. You know. Gil. Yeah, well, what, what I was asking was that uh, it sounds to me as if it's not the actual differential in fees that it's in question. It's the administration of the new work or detailing the work that would bring cost to the individuals yes. that were carrying it out. If I, if I may respond, convener, yes, to the point course. that Mr. Patterson fairly makes, um, with, with the regulations being in place, there will, of course, be a requirement for, for as the case study set out, the submission of detailed fees. In the absence of regulations, we will also require uh, solicitors to, to submit um, uh, detailed fees uh, for, for, for legal aid in this context. So, the administration, from the point of view of the solicitor, is just the same, and the legal aid board would be the, the same. But the, the beauty of uh, having passed the regulations today is that um, solicitors will not lose access to the block fee. So for that point, th that, that part of the case, they would still be able to charge the block fee and not have to detail everything in there. And there's a risk if they have to deal with detail fees, some cases, the, more, the, the less complex cases, they would probably get less fee uh, paid to them than they would currently under the block fee arrangement. Um, but, but certainly it's an administrative issue. Elaine, it's a three minute. Uh, Elaine Murray, do you want to yes, ask you? Is that all right, Minister? Off we yes. go. Yes. I met with the uh, Margaret and I met with the um, the Law Society last week, and their understanding was if this regulation wasn't passed, the situation would arise where the Legal Aid Board would make emergency payments for work done in the, the appeal court, and therefore they would still get their block fee for the initial work and an emergency pay payment for the, for the work in the appeal court. So I, d I just don't understand how this calculation or this the statement has been made. In it. That's, that's not our understanding, well, convener, of the situation, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Sorry, big pardon. I just, just for, for the record, yeah, that's not our understanding of the situation. We disagree with the Law Society on that point. I, I think we've pretty well exhausted, unless, Minister, there's anything else you want to add? Um, I would just uh, want to address a couple of points that I didn't pick up in my earlier response to, to members. Um, just in relation to the uh, access to justice, I want to make absolutely clear there is no cut to the budget um, for legal aid. Indeed, the budget has increased this year, as I've set out in the letter, uh, in the region of £4 million for the legal aid fund itself. So um, there's not been a cut to the budget. I think Elaine Murray referred to, refer, referred to that. In the uh, situation where uh, a solicitor was unwilling to take forward a case, or indeed there was some concern about uh, uh, an inability to represent someone in the Sheriff Appeal Court, clearly the PDSO could step in and indeed uh, we could sanction counsel ourselves to ensure that that person was represented at appropriate level. We'd rather not be in that position, clearly we want to work with the law society, we want to work with solicitors to ensure that the system works. But I do want to reiterate that uh, we are uh, determined to review the operation of this, the submission of detailed fees will very much inform what we do in the future in terms of potentially bringing in block fee arrangements to try and reduce the administrative burden and to bring uh, a more streamlined process for accessing legal aid. But uh, we need in a new jurisdiction, which is quite a normal, I think uh, a couple of members mentioned it in the context of this, that um, why, are we, why are we in this position? 
uh, of having to, to, to have detailed fees. When there's a change of jurisdiction, a new court being created like this, um, we do not yet know uh, in detail how the uh, landscape will look in six months' time or, or thereafter. So for the review of the data that is submitted by solicitors working with us in the Sheriff Appeal Court will help inform our understanding of the economics of how it's working and if there are any particular uh, issues of disadvantage they can be addressed. And I want to be absolutely clear there's no exclusion of any legal representative from the Sheriff Appeal Court. I think there has been a suggestion, at least one submission I've seen from the Law Society itself, that solicitor advocates would be excluded from the Sheriff Appeal Court. That might be um, an economic issue for solicitor advocates but there's no legal exclusion of anybody uh, in terms of solicitor advocates advocates, solicitors or, or indeed advocates to the council to represent a client in the Sheriff Appeal Court. Um, I, I would indeed convener with your consent. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, uh, Minister, I, I've got the Scottish Government uh, Justice Directorate's um, report here, policy note, and the final paragraph relates to the financial effects. If I read you the very last sentence, it says, the Scottish Legal Aid Board estimates that this will reduce expenditure from the Legal Aid Fund by around 1.4 million per year. Um, the, just to stress, the bulk of the savings are in relation to the personal injury court uh, that are referred to in the, in the policy note that Mr Finney has drawn our attention to. Clearly, if we are sanctioning council, as we have agreed to do in terms of guarantee for a sanction of council, that will uh, potentially increase the expense to the legal aid fund um, from the current position. But clearly, um, we will have to monitor that as part of the review to see what the impact is. Um, but I think it's a sensible measure to remove the doubt at this in transitional stage from solicitors' minds about whether they can take the risk of taking on a case to know at least they're guaranteed that council can be sanctioned if that's the most appropriate way to represent their client in the Sheriff Appeal Court, then at least they're not going to be putting their client at a disadvantage and that from a professional indemnity point of view and, and professional uh, sa safety point of view from their, their perspective, that hopefully will give them a sufficient comfort that they, they don't have to risk their own reputation uh, or indeed the, the, the future of their client in, in taking on a case without the, the knowledge about who can represent them at the Sheriff Appeal Court. If it comes to that stage, of course, it may not require appeal in due course. I want to go on because it's pretty well, because I know Rod wants to come with intervention as well. I, I just wonder if, if there's no issue with sanctioning counsel, what's the issue with sanctioning solicitor advocate? Mm. It, it, it is a, a fair question for Mr Finney. It's one that um, yeah. we are, uh, with your consent, convener, I will address. Uh, as, I, as I said earlier in the session, I'm very keen to try and resolve the, uh, the difficulties we have in getting agreement on the uh, remuneration for solicitor advocates. Um, I think they, as a group, have, have made a strong contribution to providing access to justice for people and giving people choice. And as I said last week, I very much recognise uh, the, the importance of giving people choice. We are in a situation, unfortunately, where um, we have the need to uh, put in place regulations to ensure the efficient operation of the Sheriff Appeal Court. But uh, to, to outside stakeholders, to members of the committee, I assume members that we will be reviewing the performance of these regulations in practice and uh, to come back with any necessary amendments to ensure that access to justice does not suffer as a consequence of these measures. Because I do take very seriously the concerns of the committee in that area. Yeah, I think we've, we've got, we're going round in circles a bit. We've kind of covered it all, unless this is a new point. Be grateful for clarification. Okay. Um, with your agreement, I would just like to ask uh, the Minister, in terms of uh, kind of pres um, moving towards a block fee, we talk about six months review, based on historical information, is it not possible to work to a much quicker timescale than six months? Indeed, that's a fair point that Mr Campbell makes, Convener. I, I last week suggested, and I'm happy to repeat, that um, I don't think we necessarily need to wait to the end of six months to see evidence before our eyes. If there's an emerging situation that's causing difficulty for, for uh, clients of solicitors, that would be something I would be keen to address at the earliest opportunity. Indeed, the proposal to come back with regulations to pr provide a guarantee for sanction of counsel is the first, uh, I suppose, of those uh, potential amendments based on the discussions we've had with Law Society and, and a desire to make sure that we uh, do not present difficulties for solicitors in understanding the risks they may be taking on for their client uh, and not being able to represent them fully. So I think uh, we are trying already to, to address some of the concerns. The regulations we brought before the committee will provide a, a platform on which we can, Im can improve and, and develop the regulations to ensure they work efficiently and effectively once we've got better understanding how the new Sheriff Appeal Court works in practice and any issues that arise from an access to justice point of view will clearly be ones that we would be keen to address.
Margaret? Excuse me. Briefly, I mean, you've made um, uh, uh, quite a, an argument this morning, Minister, that access to justice won't be affected. But what we are hearing clearly is <coughs> this feeling that the fee regulations won't work. Even with the contingency plans, there seems to be a recognition that's a problem here. And the practical effect of that will be that cases will be marked down, that they will never kind of know how many people lost out in this interim period because we failed to get it right. And I think that's what the committee finds very hard to come to terms with. I, I, I certainly recognise, Convener, the concerns that Margaret Mitchell fairly raises. I can understand the nervousness in the part of the committee that you'd, you'd be worried about creating a situation which is worse for, for the people needing legal services. Uh, and, and clearly I respect, uh, very much respect the sincerity of which uh, Margaret Mitchell and others have raised this point. But we do need to uh, look at the alternative. Um, I do believe that in situations where uh, potentially if there's an economic challenge to solicitors and they're looking at perhaps less complex cases which don't attract much detail fee if they were forced into a situation where we're having to submit a full account to the Legal Aid Board and be charging detail fees right from the start through to the the finish, they may be less financially attractive from some, from, for some solicitors to take those cases on, whereas under the current block fee arrangements, there's a degree of cross-subsidy, if you like, from more complex cases to the less complex cases through the, the block fee arrangement, and uh, there'll be less of a disincentive from a solicitor's point of view to take on that case. So there could be potentially, uh, I don't have any definitive evidence, and I, and I apologise for that uh, to, to, to Ms Mitchell, um, but I, I, I believe there could be a potential that uh, there could be a disadvantage from the client's point of view if they've got a less complex case, some solicitors may say, well, sorry, that's not an area that I'm particularly specialised in. You maybe have to speak to someone else about that. So there could be uh, a degree of disadvantage to some individuals, and it's purely conjecture on my part, I appreciate, but that's the, the impression I get from the loss of the block fee for the less complex cases. Well, I think that um, concludes the debate. Um, I'm just going to say to the committee some of the procedural things here. If we vote no to the motion, that would be reported to the Parliament. The Parliament to Bureau would not lodge a motion in the Chamber that the Parliament agree to the instrument. However, the Scottish Government would still be able to lodge such a motion. That's just to let you know the process. I have to say for myself, Minister, I'm not satisfied. Um, and I think if the Government were to lodge such a motion in the event that the committee votes no, that I would hope the opportunity to have an extended debate in the chamber rather than a short debate. There's too many questions remaining unanswered. They may be able to be answered at a debate in the chamber, which I understand would have to be next week. It's just a, a, an option uh, to the government, a suggestion, that there's still things, and I'm not blaming the minister for this, it's a case I think you've inherited something, but that there are issues still to be unresolved and that's just a, a, a procedural matter because I know whatever happens, if the government lodges a motion, it would be a short debate and I don't think that would necessarily be a good matter, a good way to deal with it. So I'm going to put it to the vote. Now, are members, um, um, is, are members agreed? The question is that motion S4M14088 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Will those in favour please show? Will those against please show? And those abstaining please show? That's four against, three for and one abstention. Um, that motion is therefore... Against, isn't it? Sorry, I beg, you, beg your pardon. It's, it can he count. It's <laughs> five against, three, <laughs> three four and one abstention. That is not agreed to. Um, can I then say we are required to report on all affirmative instruments... Um, now, normally I would just say to delegate responsibility for me to report on the instrument, but what I'm going to do is to circulate. It has to be um, lodged my... by the 21st. So I'll let you see what it's in, because we've had a very substantial debate, and some of the issues that have been raised would obviously be in the report. Can I thank you, Minister, and your officials for attending today, and I'm going to suspend to allow the other witnesses to come. Thank you very much.
Right, thank you very much. Moving to item two, the Community Justice Bill. It's our first round table uh, session. Uh, and we're going to have two today. I welcome each participant to the session. Each of you should have a copy of the table plan in your desk. And the purpose of the roundtable session is to allow a more informal discussion uh, amongst the witnesses. And we tend to, as a committee, sit back and let you interact. But please just indicate to me that you want to, to speak, and I'll make a note of your name, and I'll give you uh, an early warning that you're about to be called. Okay, uh, and so I think the first thing would be is to go around the table, and I always get this wrong, anti-clockwise, let me think how that is, uh, anti-clockwise and get everybody to introduce themselves before we start. Yeah. This way. I take it uh, I'm going the right direction yeah, you are. this time. You are Thank you, Elaine. Yes, uh, right. Elaine Murray, uh, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Dumfrieshire constituency and also Vice Convener. And Michael Stewart, I'm the Criminal Justice Service Manager for the Outer Hebrides and responding about the Outer Hebrides CPP submission. Yep. Margaret Mitchell, MSP Central Scotland and member of the Justice Committee. Amanda Coulthard, I manage Corporate and Community Planning in Western Bartonshire. Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. Good morning, I'm Lorraine Gillis and I'm from West Lothian Community Planning Partnership. Gil Patterson, MSP for Clyde Bank in Mulgay. Good morning, Christian Allard, MSP for the North East. Um, John Wood, a Policy Manager at COSLA. Harry McGuigan, North Lanarkshire Councillor and COSLA, Spokesperson for Community Wellbeing. And bad morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Uh, Alex McCallum, I'm the Criminal Justice Social Work Service Manager in Dumfries and Galloway. Alison McInnes, MSP for North East Scotland. And um, Councillor Peter Minamara, Chair of the South West Scotland Community Justice Authority and also spokesperson for the Scottish Conveners. Margaret Mudigal, MSP West Region and a member of this committee. Christian Graham, MSP convener and member for Midlothian South, Tweeddale and Lauderdale. Um, now, I think just, I'll just throw a question out to you to start. Is this a Community Justice Scotland Bill, is that an improvement or not an improvement on what's happening just now? Debate. Mr McNamara, first off the block side. That shouldn't surprise you, really. Um, no, I, there's a number of things in the bill, but I, I want to focus on possibly two that, that seem to me to be uh, missing from the bill. Because if we are uh, trying to achieve what I hope we're all trying to achieve is to reduce reoffending, which has been very successful under the previous structure, then surely the one thing we want to do is ensure that the new structure does exactly that, continues to reduce reoffending. For me, uh, when all of the different groups came to work together, i.e. police, the uh, prison service, parts of the judiciary, local authorities, social workers. When we came together nine years ago, it takes a lot of time for us to build up trust, to build up communications, and to build up a sort of desire to, to achieve what we have achieved in reducing reoffending across Scotland by something like 4%, which is no mean feat. So we need to put in place something that is going to do that. The reason it was able to be done is that the community justice authorities had one thing. They had the power to be able to give direction to all of those disparate groups. What is wrong with the bill at the minute for me is that we can devolve it down to community planning partnerships, but there is no power to give direction to the prison service, the police service. They will all have their own agendas. And what you really need is the power to give direction to affect what happens in your local area. That's called community justice. And it's about that influence and direction that we really need to be written into the bill and not left to the laissez-faire way it is at the minute that you simply put some uh, uh, bodies around the table in the hope that they will address the issues. Because uh, from my perspective, you need to give direction. Yes, um, ah, Ms Coulter, yes. No, it's all right, it's me. Yeah. I think just following on from, from Councillor McNamara's point, I think the, the bill as it stands has potential in, in terms of bringing 
the, the community justice outcomes within the, the umbrella of the community planning partnership and the rest of the outcomes within the single outcome agreement. I think we are, there's still work to be done is around the definition of community justice. The outcomes that currently sit within a single outcome agreement are about the community, they're about your housing, your health, your involvement in your local area. The, the definition of, of community justice within the legislation, the proposed legislation at the minute, is still very much focused on criminal justice social work and is, is missing the opportunity to embed justice outcomes within a, a wider remit and I think slightly a, a drift of the, the public sector reform agenda as a result of that. Just to add your bit, then what do you want to see in this definition that's not there? If you expand, I, please. Yep, I think that there needs to be a wider definition of community justice, which recognises the, the wider outcomes that impact on justice outcomes. So if we had more of a recognition of the wider partners involved in the delivery of community justice services, if we um, reflected the, the requirement of a prevention and early intervention agenda more than, than a justice response, a criminal justice social work response, it would allow us to deliver more of a, a significant improvement in outcomes for people who are affected by offending. My list, it's all right. I've got Councillor McGuig and then Ms Gillis. It'll come on, it should come on automatically. Thank you very much. Um, glad to be here this, uh, this morning. Um, I, 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 could I say right at the outset that as far as COSLA is concerned um, and the leaders, the leaders of COSLA, uh, we supported since the very early days the, re the redesign of community justice following the Angelina report and the Audit, Audit Scotland report. We, we did feel that it was necessary to move forward and to ensure that uh, the, the community justice agenda was genuinely community orientated, that people understood what we were trying to do, how we were working with partners to achieve the objectives, and they were able to monitor and to feel comfortable with that. Now, can I say that, 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 that I'm going back now about maybe what, three years ago, the, 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 uh, Kerry McCaskill was the, the Cabinet Secretary. We had many discussions on the detail of that. And I would have to say that um, there, there, there seemed to be a greater willingness to ensure that there was a, an ongoing dialogue between local government and Scottish government in respect of the, 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 the redesign. Um, that dialogue, I think, has become a, a, a little bit less certain in, in, in the last few months. Now, I've spoken to, to, to uh, Minister Wheelhouse, and I think is very, very much on the same page as ourselves, that it is important to make sure that local government and Scottish government are working in a complementary fashion. And that's what we want to achieve. We want to see reoffending coming down, and we want it to be done in a, 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 a coherent way. Um, I've had discussion. I've met with the, 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 the minister, as I say. And, you know, I, I feel that he supports that approach. That we get that we discuss early on what the issues and what the, the, the areas where there could be um, some um, tension between local and uh, a, a local and national government. What th th those are. Um, I have to say that I was disappointed at the, the evidence that was given. Uh, I think two weeks ago by by the, um, the, 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 the minister's officers um, when he referred to the, some of the information that uh, Cosler had put on the table as far as resources were concerned, and he seemed to um, imply that the arithmetic that we had used was somehow flawed. Now, he may be correct in that, but what he didn't do or what they didn't do, they didn't come to us and discuss that prior to the, 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 the draft being prepared. And, and that's an unhelpful way to be working. So I would hope that in, in future uh, we, we, we can work better that way. Um, one of the things that we're very concerned about, we're very pleased about Community Justice Scotland, by the way. Um, we think it's important and it can, it can certainly complement the work that we should all be doing here. It can give us the assurances that the outcome agreements are being met, that the local plans are being met. But Peter made the point about community planning partnerships. Um, I, was, I was amazed to find that community planning partnerships do not have a legal status. Or, or that's what I've just been told in the last couple of, couple of weeks. That, that, that's a very 
worrying uh, aspect because in many situations when I'm talking to people and, and uh, engaging with people, I talk about the, the hopes that I have for community planning partnerships to be working together, not just as far as re reducing reoffending is concerned, but a whole host of shared interest areas. But we're not getting that, and, and there's no mandate to do that. Now, I think it's very, very important. And we discussed this with certainly Kenny McCaskill. I didn't discuss it with uh, Mr. Wheelhouse, but I certainly will. I've sent a letter to him after when I, when I heard about the, 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 the miscalculation uh, supposed to be by uh, your, your, your officer. But we want to see... So, governments. OK, we the, the, the government. I, yes. I, I stand correct. Yes, here. oh yes. Um, so what, what, what we're, we're anxious to do is to make sure that community planning partnerships are not seen as the domain. It's not a window dressing exercise. We need to see that the partners that are around that table have got a, if not a duty, then they have to be able to demonstrate that they are working in a coherent way with local government and the other partners around that table. And we have to be reminding them that the outcomes depend upon their contribution as well as, as, as ours. So I, I would make that point that that's a worrying aspect at the moment, that um, CPPs um, would seem not to have the, that, that, that authority, but the, the, the joint integration boards will, we hope, have some statutory authority and we can move forward in that. I'll maybe come in at later points. Oh, you can, yes. I've got Thank Lorraine you. Gillis, I've got John Wood, Michael Stewart and Councillor McNamara. So I start off with Lorraine Gillis. That's the list so far. Thank you. Um, just to respond very quickly to your point, Councillor McGuigan, I think the opportunity that we have is around firmly anchoring this piece of work in the Community Impairment Act. And I think for the first time we have a sound statutory footing for community planning partnerships. And I think that's welcome. I think there has been an issue around the teeth, if you like, of community planning. And I think that the Community Impairment Act gives us a different level of influence. I agree that the power base is still, that there's still some work that could be done around that. But I think we now have a commitment and an obligation for partners to be working together to deliver outcomes, which now include a wider set of outcomes around community justice. I think the opportunity that that gives this um, this agenda is that we now have partners who previously wouldn't have recognised their role in terms of delivering against community justice outcomes, and I think that's an opportunity, and I welcome that. Um, in terms of um, what Amanda was saying, I think there is an opportunity to strengthen, and I think I would agree with what you're saying around you know, calling out much more clearly the role around prevention and early intervention. I think the other point that I would want to make is the, the other um, opportunity through the Community Impairment Act is that we also have in statute not just a, a wish but a requirement to be engaging with communities in a much more ambitious and enhanced way. And I think that that also gives us an opportunity to take this agenda forward where we haven't. So I think to sum up, I think, I think my, my overarching sort of um, comment is around the Community Scotland um, the Community Justice Scotland Bill be much more clearly anchored in what we have around the Community Impairment Act. Um, I think that there are obvious links there and obvious relationships, and I think there's obvious advantages to calling that out maybe a little bit more clearly. Dealing with that other piece of legislation, I've asked on behalf of the committee that we get Spice to show the linkages between yeah. that piece of legislation and our own, uh, which would be very helpful now that it's been raised with us. John Wood, followed by Michael Stewart, please. Lorraine is saying about putting the uh, community justice partnerships on a more robust footing that would ideally fit in with the community plan and partnership or another formal mechanism by local agreement such as the integration joint board. I suppose an observation is that we, we've sort of begun the debate talking about the, the local partnerships and, and that's welcome and we see this very much as a, a local model and that's reflected in the um, has been reflected in the government consultation material and the, the surrounding literature, but when, as any local government officer or um, colleagues around the table will know what, what sort of matters is, is the bill. And if you were just to pick up the bill, the, the local partnerships, it's not even evident that there will be a local partnership, to be completely honest, from the bill. Um, we do understand that there will be because is leading the work to, to, to um, lead the transition process for those local partnerships to be formulated, but the bill begins with um, a definition of community justice that doesn't quite reflect 
the sort of cultural shift that, that we had uh, as, as partners been, been looking for. And then immediately gives um, an outline of what Community Justice Scotland will do and then talks about the national strategy and performance framework, which are aspects of the new model that we welcome. But the, the local emphasis that's reflected um, or that's expressed by the Scottish Government and the, the local emphasis of the new model that COSL had signed up to isn't quite borne out in the legislation in, in the way that we would like. Thank you, Mr Wood. Ms. Michael Stewart, followed by Councillor McNamara. Thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, just to reflect some of what's been said already, I think that there are, um, from our own perspective in the Western Isles, there are gains and losses within what's expected here. I think that there is, um, through the Community Justice Scotland Bill, the opportunity to strengthen some of the relationships around a community justice table locally um, that perhaps weren't as strong previously under the arrangements that we had. However, there's also challenges within that, especially for areas like ourselves, and we don't have a monopoly in rurality, but certainly in terms of the difficulty of how do we engage statutory partners such as the Scottish Prison Service, SACRO, APEX, uh, other key partners in community justice who don't have a presence in our area. Um, so I think for our own point of view, there are um, local gains but potential losses um, in terms of the, what is proposed. I think the, the other thing that's been mentioned is the Community Justice Scotland and the relationship there and the national relationship, which I, which I would welcome about the strategic direction, uh, especially in terms of how that addresses some of what was brought up by the Angelini report. Um, again, I think I would wait to see in practice about how that works for an area such as ourselves. And we mentioned in our own feedback and consultation about times when a national strategy or a national agenda that commonly more rural areas tend to be a secondary thought when it comes to about how to put things into practice. So well, this committee, many no, of us represent not. rural areas. I think we all fact have yeah. rural and, and, and I was quick to point out that we don't own rurality, but certainly in a stretch of 100 miles where there's three ferries or two flights to get from one place to another. But it's a lovely part of the country. And it country, is. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yes. Could, if we could it record is. that formally, I'd be very <laughs> grateful. Um, I think it's important to recognise that one of the examples as a working example would be um, the moving forward making changes as a national strategy in terms of saying that this is how we work with sex offenders and uh, taking in the rurality that we have, a prerequisite for that training is a three or four day group work training. We will never run a group in the Western Isles for sex offenders. And then three weeks training, currently as it stands, um, on the mainland in a city, which the logistics for us is just almost impossible when people have caring relationships and things at home that need to be tended to. Now, my concern isn't so much about the logistics about that, but is if we can't solve those logistics, what does somewhere like the Western Isles do instead? When the community justice strategy is geared towards what would be seen easily as a mainland <coughs> directive and how the, the alternative could leave yourselves open to risk by using some secondary um, motion that's not accredited, it's not research-based, simply because you can't meet what's being asked. So to bring it back to the improvement or not, I think there are gains and losses, but I think what will be key in how this runs is the communication strategy and how 32 voices are heard, because every 32 voice is unique and distinct and will say they're just as special as I say the Outer Hebrides are. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that that communication strategy will be key in making sure that before national direction is taken, all voices are heard first. I think it's that balance between I could quite write the national and local mm -hmm. knowledge and, and how to deal with things in your own patch. Um, Councillor McNamara, then I've got, I'll take members now if they want to, and I've got Alison. Um, I've now got Margaret Mitchell. That'll do, Roddy, and that'll do just now. Thank you. Yes, Councillor thank, McNamara. Th thanks, Convener. Um, I, I agree that there is a great opportunity here when working with uh, community planning partners especially with devolved budgeting and uh, locality planning and all of the issues that affect communities. And one of the failures, I think, of, and I'll hands up, there was a failure within community justice authorities to actually engage with the wider community. So it's a real opportunity for local people to be involved. But when you shift the justice agenda onto the community planning partnership, there is a resource issue. 
And what the bill states quite clearly that there's two million pounds available for a national body, but there is absolutely hee haw available for local authorities. Now, if we if we don't with hee haw in it. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. I like it. Well, well, that's how passionate I am about it. No, because if yes. we want it to work, we have to resource it properly, and we can't simply leave it to the likes of officers to get on with it. Uh, if we are serious about reducing reoffending, which has an impact on our community, then we should resource it properly. And if we resource it properly, there will be a consequence of a reduced number of people in prison, a reduced public trust, and we could reinforce what happens in yeah. the community with any of the savings that we make. I think there's also an issue with the public um, who maybe think sometimes, because one gives help to people who come out of prison or intervenes to stop them going, that we're going soft in some way and they're getting something over and above other people should have. And, and I can understand that, but you're quite right. Even in hard cash terms, at the end of the day, Indeed. if you save somebody going back in, the money savings are substantial to go back into the rest of society. Indeed. So I think we, we accept that very much. Um, I'll now take some committee... Do you, does anybody else want to come in from the round table before I get committee members? Yes. It's along the lines that Peter just mentioned there about making sure that resources are available. Yeah. And he makes the point about 2.2 million, you know, that will go to, towards setting up Community Justice Scotland. But hee-haw, I'm not sure what that means, actually. I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> that, but, um, but nothing, <laughs> nothing goes to the, 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 the Community Justice uh, uh, new, new arrangements. That, that has to be rectified, and, and it needs to be detailed in the bill as far as financial, financial memorandum is concerned. It would be in the financial here. memorandum, yeah. and the Finance Committee would be looking at that as well. They'll be giving their report. I'll take some members now. I'll take Alison, then Margaret Mitchell, then Roderick, then Gilbert. If any... Anybody else wants to come in in between? I'll take you first, Mr McCallum, before I take members. Yeah, I'm, then. I'm, I'm pressing my button here and it keeps just flashing. In. No, you don't need to press. No, no, need, no need to oh, press. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I just put my hand up. Sorry. No, nothing. Just if I call you, it should go on. Oh, right. It's as good as okay. that in here. Sorry. We're very technical. I, yes. I, right. I get them. No, I, I just wanted to, to make the point in terms of the, the point that you had made, convener, about the, the, that, um, the perception, the public perception and... and, and, and uh, people being soft and on crime and so on. And, and, I, and I think the, the, the definition that's in the bill of community justice is a, is a, a lost opportunity, actually, in, in trying to bring communities with us in terms of uh, them fully appreciating what their part is in uh, w working together within communities in the various, various forums, within uh, lo local uh, organisations, faith organisations, uh, community groups, uh, schools, the, the whole gambit that um, is, is looking at uh, the whole notion of, of, of community justice in its broadest sense uh, so that the community it takes ownership of um, it, it, its uh, transgressors and, and works alongside them and the agencies and organisations that, that are uh, there to assist. Just looking at the Act, and under community justice partners, um, under section, because you're really talking about the partners rather than the definition at the beginning of community justice, there's a set in section 12, uh, 3, uh, the Scottish Amendment is made by regulations modify subsection 1 or 2, so I'm presuming that that means that others could be added rather than put them all on the face of the bill, you would have flexibility to add. One could add the amendment procedure, and that might be a very good idea. Also, it leaves yeah. a flexibility to bring in even more as, as it unrolls so that we see you know, that it's not all-encompassing. It needs to be more all-encompassing. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes yeah. sense today. You're looking at me bewildered. No, no, I'm a no, bit think, bewildered think, myself with what I've just no, said. I think, I think it is uh, <laughs> an opportunity to be all-encompassing and, and to look at... I mean, clearly there, are, there, are, there is still a need to manage those people who, who, whose behaviour is such that, that yeah, they need to be managed. Very important, and sometimes very small, long-term yeah. organisation of a big impact in an area. Yeah. I want to bring in... Before I bring you back in, I'll let Alison in, mm. and then I'll bring you in. Alison. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, the Angelini report, obviously, um, if we remember, recommended a national service that would commission and provide and manage all the adult offender services. And there's been a long consultation and, and various iterations since then. Um, but I'm interested in the um, submission that we've had from the, the, the joint submission from the community just 
justice authorities where they say that um, the lengthy consultation process in the bill itself have instead created another least worst local national compromise, such as that which led to the creation of the CGAs in the first place. Um, and the current proposals once again re restrict reform to the strategic level, leaving frontline operational delivery untouched. And I would just like the partners around the table to explore that and to say, well, what is it that we need to do to improve the bill to make sure that the operational delivery side of it um, is, is developed? Councillor McNamara, yes? Yeah. Um, well, I've outlined a couple of issues, not least uh, of all finance, not yeah. least of all uh, some form of uh, authority or power to give direction. But more importantly, it's actually defining, uh, it does say in the bill one of the partners is the local authority, but it doesn't define the role of the local councillor who has actually a reflection of the local community, I would have thought. And also, when you look at the national body, they will be appointed by this government, but there is no mention of local government being involved in that either. And it seems to me a missed opportunity to have a national body which is going to give support, encouragement, direction to the, na the, the local bodies without so much as having any local authority representation on it. So there's a number of areas. I mean, I was involved in community justice for nine years, and it wasn't until we got the Audit Commission's report that said there was some uh, lack of uh, accountability uh, and lack of governance. We could have addressed that, I believe, without so much as having to go through another bill to create a distance from the then minister. And, and I sometimes get frustrated at the fact that I thought the relationship that we had with the Minister at the time was a good one and I thought we were delivering on the agenda but suddenly an audit commission comes in and says no, the governance is not right so we need to get the governance right and that for me is having locally elected people on the, 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 the local uh, partnership body but also on the national body. Do you want to, somebody else want to come in on that then I'll, then I'll bring in Margaret Mitchell on that particular issue or is that resolved? Mr Wood. We, we've had some productive discussion with Mr Wheelhouse prior to this session about how the relationship in the future would work between Scottish Ministers, CGS and its board and, uh, and locally elected members. But I'm glad that Councillor McNamara raises the point because I think that it's, it's something that is, is missing from the detail of the, of the bill at the moment and hasn't been, um, hasn't been padded out in, in any of the other consultation materials that there, there needs to be that uh, productive relationship between local partnerships and, and the locally elected members who, who will be leading them and the, the national body. And I think that it would, be, um, it, it, would, it would answer some of the Audit Scotland questions about governance if, if that happened. Um, and I, I think, to be honest, it would, also, it, would, it would also help outcomes and it would help the model because it would um, engender a, a sense of ownership at the local level of the national agenda. Um, Ms. Ms. Gillis, do you want to come in now? And then I'm going to take the members for a bit. That's Margaret Mitchell, then Roderick, Gill and Elaine. That's my list so far. Thank you, Convener. I just want to pick up very briefly on two points. The first one was around the point that you raised about stigma and, and you also talked about... I think there's a, a wider issue that community planning partnerships are trying to grapple with around their efforts to move towards prevention and early intervention. And I think the, 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 the public perception of what that will actually mean is, is something that there's too big a gap. So I think that you know, we're, we're all pretty aware that prevention is better than cure. There's a lot of rhetoric on that. But in actuality, what that will mean is quite unpalatable actions that partners will have to take. Un unpalatable actions to the general public, not for us as professionals who are, who are on board with that. And I think that that is an issue that seems to come up time and time again. And, and for me and my local community planning partnership, that certainly hinders some of the work that we're trying to do around realigning some of our resources and trying to do some of the, the things that we know are preventative but the general public sees as being light touch and actually soft on people who are offending. So that, that's maybe the first point. I think the second point would be to pick up around resources and again you would expect me to talk from a community planning partnership perspective. From a CPP perspective I think there has never been such, a, um, such a tension in community planning partnerships in terms of their, their, the pressure on them to take forward elements of the public sector reform agenda. Quite rightly so, I think. I think we will never get where we want to get to without a focus on outcomes and through partnership working. But just, just a reminder that today we're talking about community justice, but at the moment community planning partnerships are working on implementing and acting the Community Impairment Act. We're trying to figure out arrangements for integration of joint um, of 
health and adult social care. We've also got other agendas around public sector reform. It's a very cluttered landscape for community planning partnerships, trying to bring it all together under an umbrella of broadly better outcomes for communities across West, Lo uh, West Lothian, but across the... <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm reverting, to, I'm reverting to, to, to where I'm from. But I suppose it, it was really just to pick up on that all of this broadly is unresourced. That even within the parameters of the Community Impairment Act, saying that partners will have a different, there's like different expectations, by and large, a lot of that will fall on local authorities. And that's the reality of it. And so just to make, I don't know, a plea, a support that... That is unresourced, and I do think that there is a discussion that we need to have about how we resource that to make sure that none of these work streams are happening in isolation and that actually the community planning partnership is able to do some real thinking and to pull that together, which sometimes is, is quite hard to find the time to do. Um, if members will forgive me, I'll take two more of, the, of our witnesses here, and then I'll let members in. I'd, I'd like to let some <coughs> members in. They may have an, another question, um, if that's all they'll get very cross with me. Um, I've got Mr Stewart, then Ms Coulthard, and then I'll let members in, and that would be Margaret and Roderick first. Right. Thank you, Kavina. Um, it was really just to echo the point that uh, Lorraine Gillis ma has made well, but I think the key flaw of the legislation is the definition of an offender. And the definition of an offender within the legislation is someone who has been convicted yeah. of an offence. And uh, that, for me, if I was a community planning partnership organiser and manager, I would be in a position to say, well, where does prevention come in to prevent the conviction yeah. in the first place? And I would certainly like to see that reflected, if it's not reflected in other legislation that's planned, but a much better remit and discussion within the legislation. I think we've already heard that, I think, we're quite sympathetic on the committee to mm -hmm. intervention and not just post yeah. Uh, sentence. I think we're already there. Yeah. That's there um, Ms Coulthard. Yeah, you know, I think just picking up on, on what Lorraine said, I think the Community Planning Managers Network of Scotland has had an opportunity to discuss community justice redesign a number of times and we're all in agreement there's probably not been a more exciting time to work in community planning with the range of, of reform agenda which are all coming together w within the remit of the Community Planning Partnership. But bringing us back to the, the, the funding issue and, and having a, a specific justice focus on that, we have, as community planning partnerships, been offered three years of transition funding to, to put in place the new arrangements. However, the, the, the burden of planning, the, the, all of the consultation and the legislation so far focuses on a separate community justice plan for each area, rather than it being embedded within the, the, the current local outcome improvement plan as it will be under the community impairment legislation, the single outcome agreement. If, if planning for justice was part of, of wider planning, then it would be easier for us to manage. Um, but we have had a significant lack of, of investment in the infrastructure of community planning, which is a real issue for us. And the additional burden around planning from this legislation, I think, is, is taking us towards um, just the, the, the tipping point of, of our ability to respond. I think we've got the message about funding. Um, that everybody does that with us. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, followed by Roderick, then there's Gil Elaine, then Margaret McDougall. So, uh, thank you, Margaret. Engineer. When we had the briefing on this, I think one of the, the concerns we had was what would be the relationship between the national body and the the local community partnerships and at that time we were told that we'd be very much equal partners. Now we hear from COSLA that when the consultation went on it was the, the national body supporting the community so already there's, there's been a shift and therefore you can see how people begin to get a little bit, um, a little bit worried that the, the national body would have too much influence and therefore the, the early prevention that we want to see uh, built in and, and the resourcing issues to make sure that local priorities were looked at um, need to be safeguarded. So at our last evidence session, a suggestion was made by Dame Ailish that we look at an inspectorate for community justice, the same way as you have an inspectorate for prisons or, or police, who would then look at the balance. Um, was the national body exerting too much influence where local, the local dimensions not being, take account, being, being taken account of properly? Was there sufficient flexibility to um, really address a very specific community type um, solution? And was it properly funded, etc.? I wonder how the panel felt about, um, about that suggestion. 
It's a very, very good question, uh, Margaret. Um, I certainly think that um, the community planning partnerships um, and the, the communities, commu sorry, com community Scotland um, justice, uh, we, ha we do have a nervousness about how the role of Community Scotland, Community Justice Scotland, uh, may change um, as, as they become more in, in, embedded. We, 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 we do see the, the opportunity of a sensible and productive working relationship between the, the, the integrated board and the CPPs and Community Justice Scotland. We can, we, we, we can look for advice, we can look for, for support, we can look for... Peter used a word that I don't like, though, and that was direction. And we, we would be very, very guarded about a situation where we were receiving uh, instructions in respect of programmes and projects in the local area that were being manufactured at national level. Um, inspectorate, I, I don't feel nervous about inspectorate. As an ex-teacher, you know, I've been, been through the inspectorate regimes many times. Um, it's, it's about the, 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 the way in which the inspectorate is carried out. Um, I, but I don't think I'd, I'd get terribly nervous about an inspectorate. Um, can Community Justice Scotland do that? Um, they can certainly monitor. They can comment. They can suggest uh, good practices and so on. Yep. Well, I think the, would be, uh, the inspector would be totally independent, yes. so it would be looking at how the national yeah, body was that. functioning yeah. as well as the... Yeah, the, the whole body. shebang, if I could put yeah. another word in, along with hee And the Scottish ministers. <laughs> So, um, and I, I understand your points, independent. Uh, Councillor McNamara, Mr Wood and Mr McCallum. I believe that local government and all of the agencies, the police, the prison service, are all inspected to death. And I don't see a need for yet another inspectorate to overview and oversee what is happening. What will be, uh, uh, be able to um, monitor is the reports which would be published on a yearly basis on the activities of the community uh, engagement or community justice within particular areas. And they can comment on and give direction, comment on, but maybe not give direction to. I understand the nervousness about that, but it's about overseeing, offering support, sharing good practice. These are what we're looking for. We don't need to be inspected yet again. I mean, we'd spend, with the limited resources and limited people we would have within the justice arena, they would spend their time uh, getting reports ready for inspectors, and we do that to, the, to death at, my, at the minute. So I would caution against it. No, I would say don't do it. Mr. completely support um, Councillor McGuigan. Could you speak up a little bit? You've got a lovely, soft voice, but we're a bit of difficulty at this end. That was Thank a you. compliment, by the way. <laughs> okay, right. Deep breath. Um, <laughs> I uh, completely support Councillor McGuigan and Councillor McNamara. McNamara. The idea of a, an inspectorate being created ha hadn't come up before, and Dame Eilish raised that, and it certainly wasn't we'd had anything that we'd had a chance to consider. I think that, to be completely honest, the, the case is still being made for there being an, a national body, and so to be putting plans in place to, to keep checks and balances on the national body and its relationship with the local partnerships just, just wouldn't make sense right now. Um, I, I think with sort of coming back to the legislation, I think that if we're looking for those assurances that there will be a, a constructive relationship between the national and the local elements of the model, then the bill is the chance to do that. And I think that with proper constraints around what Community Justice Scotland is able to do um, and a clearly defined set of competencies, um, between the local and the national, then we, if, if that was clarified in the bill, then we wouldn't even need to consider an, an inspectorate at this stage. McCallum, to inspect or not to inspect, that is the question. <laughs> uh, well, um, I, I think that the, the, the uh, inspectorate bodies that, that are in existence would be uh, perfectly adequate to carry out an inspection. Um, we've already had fairly successful joint inspections um, across the country in terms of uh, uh, children's services and adult services and mo more recently uh, the multi-agency public protection arrangements um, and, and the, the remit of those inspectorates could be broadened I, I think to uh, include the, the broader justice agenda without creating 
a separate inspector. Ms Coulter? Even wider than, than Alex's suggestion, we already have the, the role of Audit Scotland in reviewing the progress of community planning partnerships, and if the outcomes are going to be embedded within the community planning arena, then the Audit Scotland would, would be able to take a view then on, on whether we were delivering appropriately at local and national level on the justice outcomes as well as everything else, rather than add a, a, an additional burden in terms of inspection. And you're nodding, Ms Gillis, you agree? Yes. You agree? No inspector? No. The inspector doesn't call, right. Okay. right. Now, I go, Margaret, can I move on to the yes, next please member? Please. Thank you very much. Roderick, followed by Gill. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question really follows on a little bit from the last subject we were discussing. Dame Ailish, when she gave evidence a couple of weeks ago, uh, said that um, she said that effectiveness of community justice was not being measured at that time. She meant the judges could not be convinced that it made a difference. Uh, and she said that one of the most important aspects of her report which was not really picked on, was uh, that there was no measurement of the success of that activity. Um, are we really saying that kind of it's just enough for kind of Audit Scotland to report, or how are we really going to measure the effectiveness of community justice? Panel's view. Um, yes, not, not sure I agree with that. Uh, actually, I do think that um, there is a, a fair level of sophistication in measuring community justice outcomes through um, single outcome agreements and their um, mechanisms. What I would say is that across the country, I think there are variations in each community planning partnership's ability to measure everything it's responsible for measuring. So I do think there is there's something around that. But I'm aware of some work that's been done to support the national strategy and its development around producing a, a, a framework that is measurable, that can give us some confidence that the efforts that we're making across the wider community planning partnership are enabling us to measure what we're doing around um, community justice. So I, I, I don't think that's the case, but I would, I, I would say that, that it's not a, a simple picture. There's, it's, it's quite a, a varied look. I'm going to take uh, Councillor McNamara, then Mr Stewart, then Ms Coulter. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I, I take the same view. I think there is and there are measurements there. I've got one for South West Scotland, which I can furnish to you, which dropped from the worst in Scotland in Ayrshire, dropped from 33.9% reconviction rates, dropped to 275 within nine years of hard work by a limited resource. Um, and the other thing about uh, Alice uh, Angelini, I mean, she came to your committee and said she was glad to see the abolition of criminal justice authorities. Sometimes people get confused as to what we're talking about here. It's the community justice authority. I just thought we'd put that record straight. Confused. But there we are, you've said it. It's another thing on the report for you. Right, um, can we go on now to Mr Stewart, please? Thank you, convener. I think um, uh, no matter what I say now, it's not going to seem contentious at all. So it's <laughs> beneficial. Um, I think the key difficulty will be is about um, the potential for there to be 32 outcome plans and about how they potentially could be individualised, potentially seen as parochial, potentially measuring what we want to measure and being in a position that the, the national board have to try to make sense of that. So I would certainly appreciate the, the National Strategies Guide to be able to help us towards what so far has been an unanswerable question, I think, for justice, where how do we measure the effectiveness of both community justice and criminal justice? Because I personally feel that the reconviction rates alone do not reflect the level and quality of service and work that is undertaken daily by criminal justice, social work and partner agencies um, because you could have reconviction rates where somebody was convicted ten times last year, two times this year for much less serious things but it could still be viewed as a failure. So I think that there is room to move on the outcomes. Uh, what I would hope is, is to come back that when there are 32 aggregate outcome uh, measurements, if we are to take that way that we're measuring our own things, I would have concern about whether we're actually able to make a national picture make sense of whether we are being successful in tackling the issues that we know are, are present. Kind of so you're pro or against an inspection? Yes. You're for an inspection? <laughs> no. You're against? I'm, I'm pro and for, no, I think uh, oh. from... 
Uh, my, my own perspective is I, I agree with the, the comments that have been made that actually I think that we already have inspection uh, in place to the level that I wouldn't want us to be fixing problems that we haven't had yet. And I think that we need to be key to see how the, the National Board communicates with local CPPs before we put a, another layer of inspection in place in can case I, it happens. Can I park inspection? I know you were, you were jumping when the word parochial was mentioned, but we'll just leave that. Can we move on from inspection? I think we've heard that. Um, and, and Roddy, are you, are you satisfied? Do you want to come back? To yeah, no, no I have to, uh, I'll let other members in. I had other points, but I will let other I'll members in. I'll come back. It's some yeah. c conscious of time. Yeah. Uh, I've got Gil followed by Lee. Gil. Yeah, I would like to follow up on partnerships. And I know no matter what the circumstances are, local government is going to be a, a fairly powerful body when it comes to the uh, local body itself. Uh, and that's quite right. It's just, it goes with the, the territory. But I wondered what the what, uh, since this is all public sector here, what they feel about the, the, the third sector and their involvement and their, uh, how they should fit in uh, to uh, any um, a, a part of this equation. That's a good yes. That's a block, yes. Have a very, very big role to play in this, and third sector should be already well represented on the CPPs. Um, that's something that, that certainly many of us have been trying to change over the years as far as the evolution, if you like, of community planning partnerships to make sure that the right voices are sitting around the table there. One of the problems with the, the, the voluntary sector or the third sector is that um, the, 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 they can't all be on a CPP partnership board um, and, and, and the, the difficulties do arise in selecting um, or them nominating the, the, the voices that will be heard there. But you're absolutely correct. Um, they have a crucial role to play. Um, it's very, very valued by local authorities and by other partners in my own uh, CPP in North Lanarkshire. And uh, I, I think it will, will, will grow in terms of the effectiveness and, and the effective role that they can play. Ms Coulthard. I totally agree with Councillor McGuigan. The, the, the role of the third sector is very clear when it comes to community planning partnerships. However, that, that third sector voice at community planning partnership level is a strategic third sector voice and it's representing a, a range of issues and a, a range of groups of, of varying sizes. Where we have some work to do is the, the criminal justice voluntary sector involvement in, in community planning as we move forward and responding to community justice outcomes. I think there are a range of different organisations in each community which are very valuable. However, they're very small and, and quite often are focused on service delivery or on support and don't necessarily want to be involved in strategic discussions or strategic planning. So there's a balance for us to find between that strategic oversight and also operational service delivery. Um, I've got, now. I've got uh, Councillor McNamara, Mr McCallum, Mr Stewart. Thanks, Convener. I absolutely agree with everything that's been said, especially what you're saying there, Amanda, about the community justice uh, voluntary se sector and third sector. The one thing that's in the bill, or one thing that's missing in the bill, is any reference to the third sector. Now, if we are going to give them a place at the table, they should be treated respectfully as an equal partner and not just an add-on. And that's the one thing that is missing from the bill that is, should be introduced into the bill. Noted that, but thank you for again okay. saying that, um, Mr. McC Mr. McCallum, Mr. Stewart. Yeah, I mean, sorry. The, the point that I was going to make was in terms of um, the the mechanism for commissioning the services of the third sector, uh, and and to to, to be uh, cautious in terms of how those structures are established. I mean, we've had some difficulty with the initial uh, establishment of the, the nationally commissioned services in the Fries and Galloway, for example. Uh, we, we've benefited from the Shine Mentoring Service, but in the initial stages we had uh, two half-time workers having to respond to three different management systems, which was confusing for them and also inefficient in terms of the, the, the use of the resources. So it's about uh, making sure that we get right uh, the local and the national uh, commissioning processes so that the, the right resources are going in to meet the, the, the assessed needs of the communities that are here to serve. Mr Stewart. 
Thank you. I, I think just um, to make two quick points, one of which Mr McCallum's expressed already, which is about the, the commission and strategy is key in terms of the, the national bids for mentoring. Um, in my own perspective, weren't truly national, that uh, they only considered some of the more difficult re to reach areas really after the granting of funds had been made, and uh, that as such, I don't think there is an equitable service. I think the other thing is just to note what is probably uh, that I know has been raised uh, to committee before is that the short termism of funding makes it very difficult for third sector to be able to survive and not have to morph and change to be able to chase pots of money. And I'm aware that your committee has had that. Last time, yes, yes, but it has been ongoing for um, decades in here. Mm -hmm. um, Elaine, and then followed by Margaret McDougall, followed Thanks. by John. Uh, one of the things, uh, that, and uh, Alison McInnes already referred to this, that uh, Elish Angelini's report suggested was a joint community justice uh, Scottish Prison Service Board bringing the two of them together. And I wondered whether the bill actually misses the trick in, in not actually looking at that. Uh, because that might facilitate both the understanding of the roles of prevention and uh, punishment in the community as opposed to um, imprisonment and might facilitate resource coming from the prison service into community justice or do you think that would just actually it would, because it would be a national body would that actually just uh, reinforce if you like the centralisation that the money might not come down to the partners? Uh, which actually needed to have the money. I just wondered what your, your views on that might be. I've got, I think it was Ms McCallum you wanted in there, is that right? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would agree that the, the, the board would be a good thing. I think if it, in, in the long run, if we're looking uh, to move people out of prisons and into the community, then the resource needs to move from the prisons to the community. Um, and and I, I know that that's a, a long-term objective, but clearly, uh, if that's an objective, then th those bodies meeting at a national and, and as far as is possible, also in lo at local level, would, would be a good thing. And I think we have missed a trick to some extent by that board not being uh, part, part of what's in the bill. Thank you. I've got my councillors muddled up. Is it Councillor McNamara or McGuigan that wants Both of you. <coughs> you do a duet, do you? No. Councillor McNamara, it's you. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I would be, uh, again, cautious about setting up yet another... Uh, a joint body overseeing because from my perspective I think that the setting up of the community planning partnership joint arrangement for community justice that would be the vehicle for example for setting up the local community units to support women why do we need it's not a prison that we're creating it's a support mechanism that would be put in place and the community justice uh, element to community planning would be the ideal route for that overseeing for that delivery and indeed, if we are empty in prisons, then the prison service are obliged to look at their budget and say, for example, at Pullman, when I first got involved, there was 800 young people in Pullman. You go to Pullman, now there's less than 400. And yet the government have still built two large extensions that are now almost half empty. So there has to be a link up between the policy and the actual capital expenditure. And I, I understand what you're saying, that it would sound ideal to have a national body, but no. I think what you do is that the government instructs, because they are government agents, that if they are saving money in their budget, then that saving, as we spoke about earlier, would be devolved down to the local community for the local community to decide how best that would be utilised. I've just said not on section 12, which is the community justice partners, which includes the chief constable of the Scottish Fire and Rescue so Skills Development, why the SPS isn't in there. Yeah. The Scottish Prison Service? Yes. Yeah, the Scottish Prison Service should be there. It's not. Is it? Where is it? It's one of the partners. Yes, I'm Scottish. Oh, Scottish Minister, I beg your pardon. It's because... Aye, I beg your pardon, you're right. Yes, no, it's all right. I'm just getting myself befuddled. Uh, you did want in, Councillor McGuigan. There is a role for the SPS to play both nationally and locally. And uh, I think we have seen evidence of a, a, a change in attitude by the SPS. It's becoming more outward going. It wants to engage with the communities. And that's happening. And I think it's uh, uh, beneficial. The, 
the, the, the role that it would have nationally, I think we have to be careful about the, the, the simply saying it'll, it'll operate through the, the Community Justice Scotland um, mechanism. Because we don't want to see, I don't want to see a powerful body up there. I want to see that activity taking place in the, in, 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 at the lower level. Yeah, um, Ms Coulter. Yeah, I completely agree with the aspiration of, of bringing the, the SPS more into the discussion on community justice and, and potentially having a joint board would, would free up the resources and allow them to flow back. I think that the resource flow is the important bit there and, and there would be a concern that if the, the Community Justice Scotland Board and, and the, the Prison Service Board were combined, that it takes us back to a criminal justice discussion rather than a community justice discussion and takes us away from that prevention early intervention focus that we're looking for. I think the confusion for me is the uh, subsection H, which refers to the Scottish Ministers, and I'd prefer to see it as yeah. say, the SPS rather than the Scottish Ministers, because that, to me, is not the SPS. Uh -huh. um, that's fine. Margaret McDougall, followed by John, please. Thank you. Um, I should perhaps say at the outset that uh, I was conv vice convener to, to Peter on the South Scotland, South West Scotland, Community, South West Scotland Justice. Community Justice uh, Authority, uh, and we were also councillors together on North in North and Ayrshire. And you know, oh, yes, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's uh, just a reproduction of things before. So um, I wanted to mention around the quote from Clelan Snedden from the last evidence session, where he said, "The bill would be strengthened if the central role of CPPs." was reinforced and there was greater clarity about the duties on all partners to contribute locally. And as a previous convener of a, a CPP, I just wonder, you know, you spoke, Lorraine and Amanda spoke about the pressures on CPPs. I just wonder if this is one challenge too many. I, so there was that and also on the third sector, I know how difficult it is for you know to get the third sector involved in CPPs and have them truly represented. So there is an issue around how the third sector will be represented uh, within this bill. And my other um, question is around um, offenders, families, and victims. I mean, are they adequately represented in all this? I haven't seen anything. I haven't heard anyone mention anything about that um, this morning so far. So. Direction. So I, I think I'll take Ms Gillis first. I take it you're wanting to say something. Yes, and then Ms Coulthard, because you were both <laughs> nodding and doing this. So, right, OK. We've got very informal suddenly. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, no, I don't think it's one challenge too many. I think it's about time, to be, to be perfectly honest. And I think the Community Impairment Act gives us a strengthened sounding board for starting to move ahead in the terms that, that you're discussing. Um, I think on the third sector, I think that there are challenges and, 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 and how the third sector engage. I think they're, at the moment the expectation is that they engage through the third, third sector interface model and there are some challenges in, in terms of how that's been rolled out across Scotland. Um, some very, very, very good examples of where that relationship is working very well and the third sector is engaged strategically and operationally, but there are also areas where that isn't working as well. So I do think that that, that does need some attention. I would say though that um, the community planning and community impairment gives us the opportunity to engage others who aren't necessarily engaged in community justice outcomes. I'm thinking particularly of local employers, private sector, Scottish Court Service. I think there's a whole raft of um, organisations that we would like to have better engaged. So I think calling it the third sector is, is one of those, but I think there are, you know, there are others that I would probably look to having a, an enhanced level of engagement through community planning and through community impairment than we have before. And just to, to finish, I totally agree. Um, I'm on and linked into sort of several different work streams around the national strategy, and that's something that we have been looking at, particularly around victims and families, and where, where are they in this whole agenda? And I'm not convinced that they're called out strongly enough. Just agreeing completely with what Lorraine said. It's it's more an opportunity than a step too far for us. I think there's a, a really good opportunity in terms of timing round about the empowerment legislation, public sector reform, and justice reform to allow us to bring everything together and, and be much more person-centred in how we approach all of the work that we're doing. Um, I think we, we do need to think differently about how we engage with a range of different stakeholders in this work. 
but that engagement has to be at the appropriate level for the people that we're trying to involve. So there's a huge amount of work to be done on, on families and victims and offenders themselves, but it doesn't necessarily have to be at the writing of a justice plan level. I think we have to, to think differently about how we commission services, how we consult and engage service users and, and local community members on what services look like for their area and what the need is in their area. Um, we have some great examples of third sector interface work to pick up on and, and learn from that, but a fair way to go on it, I think. Thank you. I have Mr Wood, Councillor McGregor and Councillor McNamara. Thank you. Just, just a Mr Wood first, sorry. Sorry. Just, just a couple of quick points in response to uh, the member's question. In terms of Cleland Sneddon's quote, um, yes, we, we would absolutely agree that the, the role of the CPP should be explained more clearly within the bill. Um, I think that we are yet to hear a convincing answer as to why that isn't the case, and it would be interesting to hear that from the Minister. Uh, that, uh, Each one of you, mm -hmm. uh, shortly, and just say if there's one thing that you want changed in the bill okay. or added to the bill so you do, you'll get your chance okay. then and okay can i respond just to the, yep the, pick, picking up on the on the question that was asked in terms of um in terms of bringing in the, the contributions from community planning partners or community justice partners i think that section 30 of the bill is the opportunity to do that and it's not quite robust enough in in, in, in its wording at the moment um and then if, I, if i'm being pressed then just to reiterate Amanda's point about yes, in, involving uh, families and victims, and, uh, and absolutely um, people with convictions as well in the, in the co-production of services. Unless you have something different, councillors McGuigan and McNamara, you team, the team councillors, can I? You have. No. Just to say this, we, we cannot, should not, no, and must not no run away from the no, challenge. No, you have nothing different to say. So <laughs> we'll stop you right there because what I want to do, as I said, bearing in mind that the next round table sitting waiting, is to come round and say to each of you, you know, which one thing would, just one, not a big story, one thing you would like to add or change in the bill in summation. Now, where do you want me to start? Are you, who wants to start here? I'll come round in order. Is somebody ready, Mr. Wood? Are you ready? Mr. Stuart, beg your pardon, are you ready? Uh, Helps if I get your name right. Yeah. right. Uh, I think the key thing for myself would be the prevention agenda is made more clear. Um, I think it is a massive mistake to miss out making clear the CPP focus on prevention if we want to engage CPP partners prevention. around the table. Ms. Coulthard. Strengthening local governance and accountability through community planning partnerships. Ms. Gillis. Resource. Uh, I think we need to look at how we resource that. Mr. Wood now, sorry. A uh, robust footing for the local partnerships and limitations as to what Community Justice Scotland will do. Councillor McGregor. Right, um, the bill should be absolutely clear about the role of the community planning partnerships in this whole venture. It should define it more, more clearly. And we should not, and I'll say it again, we should not run away from the challenges. It isn't a challenge too far. Community planning partnerships should be working together, sharing resources and making a difference to the communities yep. that they serve. Mr McCallum. Um, I, I think I would like to see the, the definition of community justice broadened out so that it's uh, as, as broad as uh, it could possibly be. I would, like to see a, I would like to see a clear empowerment to the local community justice arrangements so that they have the influence to drive forward this agenda, which is extremely important, it's been pointed out. Mm. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank you all for your evidence. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and the, the committee did and that you find it useful. If there's anything else you wish to add, perhaps following on what you hear next or what you read next, do write to me as convener and it will be shared with the entire committee because sometimes you think of things afterwards. I'm going to uh, suspend for five minutes to allow the next witnesses to sit round and get their places. Thank you very much and stretch my legs.
Thank you. Uh, now, resuming, and we go into our second round table. I welcome the new participants to the session. I know that I think all of you were sitting through part, at least, of the previous session. And um, you know, you've therefore got the idea of how we do this. If you indicate to me that you want to say something, I'll call you, put in a list, I'll tell you where you are, and your light comes on automatically. Well, not your own light, the light in front of you comes on <laughs> automatically. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to do it again, and this time I will remember what anticlockwise is. Thank you, Elaine. And we will move around and introduce ourselves. I'll start with myself. I'm the convener, Christine Graham, and I'm the member for Midlothian, South Tweeddale and Lauderdale. That's uh, Elaine Murray, member uh, for Dumfrieshire and uh, vice convener. I'm Mark McSherry from the Risk Management Authority. Margaret Mitchell, MSP Central Scotland and member of the Justice Committee. <laughs> Theresa Medhurst, Director of Strategy and Innovation for the Scottish Prison Service. I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. I'm Sean McKendrick from Social Work Scotland. Hey, Gil Patterson, MSP for Claybank and Mulgay. Christian and our MS people's in office. <laughs> Thanks very much, Colina. Hello, I'm Graham Foster. I'm the Director of Public Health and Strategic Planning at NHS Forth Valley. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. John Watt, Chair of the Parole Board for Scotland. Alison McInnes, MSP North East Scotland. Grant Manders from Police Scotland. Margaret Mudrigal, MSP for West Region and a member of this committee. Much now, as I threw it out before, you know, what's good and bad, like the curate's egg, what's good and bad about this proposed piece of legislation? Does somebody want to just open up, first of all, from our witnesses? Oh, I can tumbleweed time. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. McKendrick. Thank you, convener. I, in terms of the, the proposed bill, there are a number of advantages and I maybe just start with the positive uh, because in, on reflection in terms of what I might say there might be some more negatives associated with the bill than the positives associated with it. What, so the positive parts of it is, is the commitment to a national strategy around community justice and the positive element of it is in relation to the uh, outcomes and performance improvement framework. Uh, these are principles as they stand just now. Uh, none of uh, the consultees have, have saw the final detail of, of those uh, elements of the positive aspects of the bill, but uh, they're broadly welcomed in relation to that. It's uh, incredibly helpful for local government and other partners to be clear around what they want to uh, provide and produce in terms of outcomes and a clear uh, strategy should hopefully draw partners together to be much more effective in delivering community justice strategies. So in relation to uh, some uh, more concerning aspects of the bill, and I apologise I might uh, reiterate some of the end comments of the last session, but maybe, maybe duplication in this instance might be quite helpful. So in relation to this, I, mean, I think it's a, a fairly poor and narrow definition of community justice. Uh, earlier respondents uh, and indeed contributors to this uh, committee commented on its uh, lack of mention of early intervention and prevention. That, uh, frankly, is, is deeply concerning. Uh, Again, in terms of, of the, the, the notion of the creation of community justice partners and the nomination of them, the consultation process uh, did not indicate a body uh, in terms of in the enshrinement of community justice partners uh, in localities. I indeed uh, went on to kind of reflect the importance of community planning partnerships, and, uh, and whilst I'll not get the quote exactly correct, the government uh, response to the consultation in December 2014 indicated that the governance, and I mean governance in the broadest structure around performance and finance and accountabilities, uh, would lie with community planning partnerships. So that in itself was, 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 is a particular concern. And building on from that, and, and the last major aspect that causes us concern is, is that the function and relationship between Community Justice Scotland and local partnerships and the way that that's articulated uh, might uh, open itself to misrepresentation and, uh, frankly, an unhelpfulness in delivering the forms of outcomes and services that can uh, deal with what we would all want from, a community, from an effective community justice uh, service. Thank you very much, Ms Methurst. From a Dr. perspective, um, it's given us the opportunity to work at a national level on um, the strategy and performance and to look at the outcomes together as well. Um, so we've been able to, to input at um, and are still inputting at a national level. I think at a local level for most of us as national bodies, we are 
we were dealing previously with eight um, community justice authorities and moving potentially to 32 um, uh, community um, planning partnerships, then how we engage with 32 different um, authorities may prove um, challenging and that's work that we potentially are, or that's work that we are doing at the moment. Um, in addition to that, we um, are pleased that the definition um, for those who are coming out of custody in terms of who's involved with those um, partnerships has been broadened out because as offenders leave our custody and return to communities, there are more challenges than exist just within community justice um, for resettlement. Um, so that broader definition, as was discussed earlier, definitely gives more impetus to wider access to services and supports for offenders when they, they leave custody. So from, from a Scottish prison service, perspective, whilst there are some challenges that we are currently working on in terms of how we get appropriate representation and input at a local level, um, which we um, have identified will um, initially be done through um, a, a mapping out of those partnerships, what the implications are in terms of the, the types of information that are required and how we can provide that information um, and also to provide um, some leadership um, through the identification of um, governors in charge who will represent uh, the SPS at a local level. So we're working through that at the moment, um, but in, in very broad terms, obviously, we're, we welcome this opportunity to look at shared outcomes, um, much more effective local planning um, for those who are leaving custody in that difficult transition back into the community again. To the details of the bill, I wanted to just, from a public health standpoint, um, really start on a very positive note and say that actually we're very um, enthusiastic about the content of the bill. I think it's very, very important that we recognise uh, the importance of the cycle of offending and reoffending um, in tackling Scotland's public health problems. It's deeply linked to the cycles of poverty and deprivation that our communities face. Um, it's a clear element in persisting inequalities in our communities um, and we think it's a really positive step forward. Um, we actually welcome the clear recognition of the importance of community planning in this so I think it's very important that we do keep doing this through community planning partnerships because they are the vehicle that we are currently working with our local partners to tackle many of these issues. Um, so that's very positive. Um, we'd like to see um, single outcome agreements continuing to be a main vehicle in tackling some of Scotland's public health challenges and that's really important too. Um, and then just a third element, I think it's important that the Bill recognises the role of alcohol and drug partnerships and as the Chair of an Alcohol and Drug Partnership, I think it's very important that we recognise the clear links um, to substance misuse in its many forms and it's good that the Bill recognises that and starts to move that forward. Nobody else has indicated from our witnesses they want to come in right now. That was a challenge that I hoped you would take up, Chief yes. Superintendent. You go for it. it uh, it's a challenge I, I'd be delighted to take. And, and in a similar vein, uh, by and large, we welcome the opportunity uh, that the, the bill gives us to tidy up um, this area a wee bit. Um, and, and similarly to, to what you've heard already, um, and at risk of sounding like a broken record, we do recognise that as it's currently constituted, there might be some challenges around that. We particularly welcome... Um, the, the emphasis on uh, community planning um, or what we thought was the emphasis on community planning that maybe hasn't translated uh, through the bill into, uh, into delivering that potential. Community planning and local outcome agreements is where this stuff ought to get delivered. And if it is delivered through that, I think we can tidy up the interface with ADPs and the like uh, more successfully than under any other system. So I, th I think um, there's a real potential there that we recognise and we think that, that uh, the bill maybe needs to be a bit more explicit around some of this. And, and just to sort of underline that, you know, that it's the terminology that sits around the bill like community justice partners as opposed to community planning partnerships and the like that I think might cause um, some confusion. If... Community justice is to be delivered successfully. The continuum, the spectrum of partners, you know, is, is huge. And these partners are not necessarily what we would recognise immediately as traditional criminal justice or even community justice partners. 
And I think you've already heard evidence um, from people talking about housing and, and all of that sort of stuff. You've already talked today about the importance of the third sector and some of the niches that sit in the third sector. All of that is really, really important. And so it's that local, that local cut and thrust that I think is really important to delivery. So I, I think the, the final point that Police Scotland would like to make, and in, in fact there are two final points. Firstly, for this to be successful, it needs to be a whole systems approach. It needs to be right from start through to finish, and that then leads you on to the emphasis on prevention and early intervention. Partners locally recognise the terminology of whole systems approaches, of, of all of that sort of stuff. We have been doing this in youth justice now for a number of years, and, and Sean and I have worked really closely on that in Glasgow in an operational sense. But if I was to go into my current role in Argyll and Butte, they are equally adept, knowledgeable and practised at delivering whole systems. For me, successful community justice is a whole systems approach. It would be nice if some of that language, some of that experience, some of that good practice was encompassed in the language of the bill. Um, that, that's, that's a nice. The other thing that I worry a wee bit about, and, and uh, a number of contributors to the Police Scotland response worry about, is the resourcing of all of this. And, you know, there seems to be the only money that is mentioned in this is the money for Community Justice Scotland and the Section 27 monies, which are there anyway. And if you keep delivering on the Section 27 monies in the same way as we've always delivered on the Section 27 monies, not very much is going to change. So there's some issues that sit around the resourcing and, and you know, the, in the broader kind of sphere of things. And I know you discussed that in the, in the first session as well. So from what was meant to be two sentences, I seem to have been going on for about 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, I think I was listening. Yes, I was. Uh, who's, does anybody else want to come in before I move to committee members? Right, committee members, who wants to come in now with questions? John, I'll take you because you weren't in last time. Okay. Um, I would like uh, the panel's views on what um, public awareness of the, the, the partnership should be. A lot of people I encounter have never heard, have no experience, and that is the ca case across the, the public sector, of course. Um, is that important or are we needing more? In public involvement? I'm not sure I'm going to commit to answering first every single question. However, uh, you'll, you'll note from uh, Social Work Scotland's uh, contribution, we, we made a mention of the involvement of community. The reality is that's where uh, people who are, off, who are providing these services and receiving these services are actually in. I don't think the public has a significant awareness. Indeed, in actual fact, one of the things that we would welcome is uh, the uh, Community Justice Scotland having a responsibility to promote the benefits of engagement, uh, promote the benefits of desistance, and in actual fact work collectively with organisations and partnerships to deliver those types of interventions. So I think the, the short answer to your question is, is that I think the public are quite far removed in many respects from the rehabilitative element of uh, offending behaviour. They're clearly focused on uh, creating, managing and indeed dealing with those that, that commit offences. But the other side of that particular coin in terms of their understanding of the rehabilitative nature of it and the reasons why, particularly and very well highlighted in the Commission on Women Offenders report, why women uh, or why women and indeed some men get involved in some form of offending. So I think that there's quite a bit of debate with the public to be had. Uh, and I think politicians, uh, as well as partnerships, uh, in terms of both community uh, planning partnerships and the Community Justice Scotland, has a significant role to play. I think, in fairness uh, to the drafters, in Section 3, uh, subsection 1D of the Bill, one of the functions of Community Justice Scotland is to promote public awareness of benefits arising from. So it is there. It might not be wide enough for you, but it's there um, in the Bill. Uh, Ms Metters. Um, just to reflect a point that was made earlier um, in the previous session that um, particularly um, the SPS and the work that we do very often there is an adverse public reaction to some of the more innovative practices um, or trying to improve outcomes by doing things differently um, and that adverse publicity can um, actually then have a negative impact on those individuals that we're trying to transition back into communities. So I think there is something around about public awareness for us all that we need to take 
more of what we're doing back into communities to get a better understanding from them as to what we require in terms of their support, because these are their citizens. When they return to communities, they're no longer offenders, they are no longer um, people in prison, they are citizens um, of our community and they should be treated as such. Thank you. Christian. Yes, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, we had on the, uh, we, I read some of the submissions and some of them talked about uh, this bill being an enabling bill. And we heard a lot this morning about how uh, more limited it should be and uh, who should be engaging, which, who should be on it uh, as a partner and should, who should, you know. We, we're trying to define a lot about, uh, find a lot of definition and adding a lot to this bill. Do you think it will strengthen it, or do you think it will maybe weaken the idea of being an enabling bill and being a lot more um, permissive of what can be done at local level, particularly local authorities who are very diverse from one another, and who can interact? We heard this morning about the private sector uh, could be involved as well. So you could have a different picture, a very different pictures in all local authorities. So how much do you think we should... Uh, uh, we should change the bill the way it is to keep, uh, or should we uh, leave it as, uh, as an enabling bill, as some of, uh, of the submission described it as? I take it you're focusing on section 12, is that right? Community justice partners? Yeah. Yeah, maybe look at that and see whether we should have more a list or whether once you start a list, you never know where to stop it. Any comments, please? Well, can I'm going to ask something of the SPS. I see you're under H as the Scottish Ministers. Do you happy about that? Um, the Scottish Prison Service, we had um, duties placed upon us to work with community justice authorities. We have duties placed on us to work with the community planning partnerships. So we fully understand that we have a role to play and that we should... Um, it's not why I asked. You're under H as... The Scottish Ministers, under Community Justice Partners, uh, Section 12, uh, subsection 1H, in the list you're defined, I understand, as the Scottish Ministers now. You, I mean, should you not be there as the Scottish Prison Service? Um, it makes more sense to me. We're an agency of, of um, Scottish You've Ministers. You've been very so. diplomatic, but I don't want you to be diplomatic. I want you to tell me whether you should be there as the Scottish Prison <laughs> Service. Because I've been reading this would not understand. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. I understand why you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, Somebody else answer for this good lady who's not for fair task. Who would find it more helpful to be the Scottish Prison Service there? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd, I would make the point that, um, similarly, I don't think Crown Office Property and Fiscal Service are specifically mentioned uh, in that either. And, and I think there would be an argument, you know, along the same lines in relation to that. I also noticed that the Chief Constable is the only individual that's mentioned there, and I just I wonder why that is. Um, so, uh, uh, and I make it for no other point than it is the only individual. Everybody else is named by the so organisation. So just should be Police Scotland. So just Police Scotland. Because, and Crown Office, yeah. Pocket of Fiscal yes. Service, and possibly, but not necessarily, the Scottish Prison Service. <laughs> but I think, it, I mean, legislation should be understandable by other yep. people. And I don't think this is understandable. Uh, any other, but more comments? Dr Foster. Uh, thank you. I, I was just going to echo that. And, in response to the question about community involvement, I think what, there are a number of things that are currently ongoing which are about trying to deliver community empowerment and engage communities. And to, to give a simple answer, it needs to be simple um, because the, the people cannot understand our very, very complex arrangements. And I've frequently heard the public landscape described as a rather crowded dance floor, for example, and at the moment it is very crowded and we are introducing new bodies into it and the more bodies we introduce into it, the more difficult it becomes for our population to understand and the harder for us to all engage. So uh, in uh, the, the, the call is to try and make it as simple as possible. Any, any other comments? Christian, are you finished? No, it's, it's, nobody wants to answer the, the question about the enabling bill. Uh, should it be an enabling bill or not? Or should it be more prospect, uh, prescriptive, you know? Uh, prescriptive. Yes, Mr. McSherry. 
I think just in that particular point in relation to our functions, as I always get this acronym wrong, an NDPB, um, who has a responsibility to promote effective practice, undertake research and deliver training. I'm not sure if the bill provides specification in relation to the overlap between the functions of the new body and our own responsibilities in relation to those who pose a risk of serious harm. However, I'm not sure that necessarily the legislation needs to detail what those relationships are, as long as there's uh, a commitment to undertake further discussions as to how those two, two bodies sit together. Ms McKendrick. Try and tackle the question about, about uh, it should be enabling or prescriptive. I, mean, I think degrees of flexibility are always welcome in terms of planning services. And I, I think that the answer to your question is in part what the national strategy tells us and what the outcome uh, and improvement framework actually tells us, because that in itself uh, should be enabling and should be wide and broad encompassing enough for partners involved in the delivery of community justice services to be engaged within. So I think the permissiveness is, is helpful and welcome. I think there's an absolute and clear connection with the national strategy and what that says. And again, you know, it's not written as yet. Uh, and I think there's a, a connection around uh, the national performance and improvement framework that will come as well, that will give the degree of flexibility that is required. I'd also want maybe just to make a point that I had made earlier on in relation to the concerns around the relationship that's articulated within the bill between Community Justice Scotland, locality, uh, criminal uh, community justice partners and CPPs. I think with the, the new development around the nomination of community justice partners and the lack of mention of community planning partnerships, we've actually missed an opportunity to be more flexible and actually to be more permissive. And I mean that by, I, 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 I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, community planning partnerships, as we all know around this table, are well established. They deal with a host of complex, uh, difficult problems that our communities face. They pull on a wide variety of resources. They've got significant governance and significant experience in planning. My concern in relation to the uh, engagement of Community Justice Scotland with that was that A, it will take some time to form, and B, the clarity around its relationship and the accountability uh, between Community Justice Scotland, local partners and the national body is not particularly well articulated and can lead to a uh, significant misinterpretation. So in summary, I think it's helpful that there's uh, a permissiveness, there's an enablement, I think that it's not necessarily in legislation that that's best reflected in terms of, of the objectives behind the bill. I think the strategy and the outcomes framework is where that should be. We await with interest to see how that's shaped and what that actually says. That's why Social Work Scotland gives this a cautious welcome in relation to, to these elements, because these, bill, these aspects that support the bill, support the permissiveness and support the flexibility that's required are not yet known and not yet articulated. So, uh, uh, and the position is, is that flexibility is good. We await these two elements of the, of the supporting aspects to the bill, and we will see in due course as to whether or not it's permissive enough to create the flexibility of service provision that's required in this area. In a way, it's perhaps when it's up and running, to some extent, is when these things sort themselves out to an extent. I'm not saying it solves everything, but in a way, it's a, not a suck it and see, but once it's there... We are rebalancing, I would think. And, no, uh, practice, tells us, pra practice tells us that's the case. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I guess, however, it's important that the outline of what will be developed uh, post the legislation is really quite important and, and addresses oh, yes. a number yes. of, of, of different issues. Indeed. Uh, Roderick, followed by Elaine, please. Yeah, thank you, Convener. To some extent, my question has been answered. But I'd just like to pose the general question to the, the panel, whether they think... The bill, as, as it stands, seeming it might be tweaked slightly, will enhance the, the attraction of community justice to judges. Yes? Anyone want to comment? More tumbleweed. Um, I think sh sheriffs and judges like to know what's out there before they make disposals. Well, well they do. That, that was the point it. I was going to make. I'm, I'm I was a fiscal for 35 years before I retired and took this pro board job. So looking back to then, um, I think you're right, uh, Chair. Judges have to understand what's out there for them in their area, what programmes are available, um, what um, schemes are out there that they can use. So until they see it operating on the ground and actually happening for them and in social background reports in front of them, I don't see there's much in it for them at the moment. There are then. 
And that's that one then nailed to the floor. <laughs> Elaine, followed by Margaret Mitchell, please. Yeah, the, the previous session, um, there was concern expressed uh, by one of the contributors to the about the fact that they was two million pounds for Community Justice Scotland, but as he put it, he offer the uh, community justice partners at a local level, and I wondered if that was a concern for for you as well. And going on from that, um, the bill doesn't follow the Angelini uh, recommendations that there should be a joint community justice and prison service board, which might have facilitated some transfer of funding from the prison service to community yeah. justice. And I wondered whether, you know, your, your views on that, whether that was necessary. Some, in the previous um, session, some people thought that might have been a good thing. Some people thought it might not have been. I have so. to say, when you mentioned he who I was watching the official report, <laughs> studiously writing it down again. <laughs> Yes. Um, questions then? Answers to that, please. Funding? Yes. Um, Kavina, I'm quite happy to speak to the, the first part, and, uh, and Theresa will probably speak to the second part of that. So in, in terms of the, the initial question, uh, uh, the hee-haw question, um, it, it, it has been the subject of discussion locally in community planning partnerships, and I sit in two community planning partnerships, um, and it would be wrong to say that this has been missed. And I noticed that both Lorraine and Amanda, um, you know, kind of backed up the hee haw question as well. It is one that, that I think is really quite important to address. Yes. <laughs> HH. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it, it is really important to us because even if we look at how community justice authorities are currently configured, there's a small resource there working in policy, performance, analysis, all of the outcome-based stuff that, that we currently um, look at that allowed Peter and others to talk about their uh, splendid results um, in the past. Um, under this notion, some of that resource, in, in my reading of it, would transfer to Community Justice Scotland, but there'd be no resource left other than what's currently in community planning arrangements. Now, there is no doubt that the current staff and community justice authorities have built up an expertise and a knowledge in, in this field that perhaps is not translated into the broader community planning governance arrangements. And if that resource isn't transferred, to me it presents some threats, and uh, that's the point I would make around that. You had a question about joint. Yes, Ms Medhurst. Um, <clears throat> with regards to um, budgets, obviously, with the current funding arrangements, um, there is no unallocated resource that the, the Scottish Prison Service has. Um, our position currently, obviously, is that um, there is still a significant churn in terms of the short-term population um, and the number of um, prisoners with um, high care needs and the complexity um, of those who are coming into custody in terms of high risk um, is increasing as well. Um, I know that there is a, a suggestion that um, presumption against short-term sentences might be extended, and I think there was also um, evidence given to the committee in February around about the pr prisoner control of release bill, which will potentially have an impact on prison numbers as well. So whilst um, at some point there will have to be consideration given to that, it needs to be at a point at which we can see that there has been a reduction in the overall population um, and that we're in a position to be able to manage that going forward. Yes, I was wondering whether there was merit in the Angelini suggestion that it, actually the prison service and the community justice authority should be one, one board. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether, whether that, I mean, obviously the government maybe feels this is not the time to do that, but whether they actually felt that was, you know, that was a, a, a trick that had been missed in this bill. I, mean, I think, in light of Angelini, the, um, there was a consultation undertaken by um, Scottish Government, and obviously out of that, these are the arrangements that are seen to be most appropriate at, at this time. So, um, as the Scottish Prison Service, we obviously um, are very concerned about, and it was, it was welcoming to hear Mr McGuigan's comments um, on the fact that we are becoming more outward-facing that we understand and appreciate that the strength of partnership working and in communities and taking individuals out of custody and that transition is really important um, in the path, in the desistance path um, and ultimately in reducing reoffending. So we will engage in that in whatever um, shape this turns out to be. Mr McKendrick. 
maybe uh, come to the question about the board in, in a second, but I just would want for the record to endorse uh, the comments uh, made by Mr Manders in terms of the, the funding related question and the concern associated with that and the experience built up in relation to report and analysis. I come to the question around about board. I'm, I'm frankly not really sure about a board. I think the issue that needs to be considered and I think requires some further reflection as to the mechanism of is around about justice reinvestment. The Audit Scotland report pointed to three billion pounds being spent on dealing with, with offences. Now that's not all connected with prison, but it is, an, an, it is a, a significant amount of money. Now if we were to look at uh, the mechanism around justice reinvestment, whether it's a board that exists between uh, the Community Justice uh, Scotland and uh, the Scottish Prison Service, as I said earlier, I've got some uh, misgivings and I'm not absolutely certain on that. What I'm absolutely certain on is, is that we need some form of reflection and structure that once we uh, are able to actually re-establish or manipulate those individuals remaining in the community with proper supports, we should have a mechanism that looks at that form of readjustment and resource realignment. Whether it's a board or not, I'm not really certain. But I would like us, either in the strategy or in the bill, to reflect a, a mechanism for doing that. Do you mean money coming, if successful, money from the SPS budget yes. flowing? Yes. We've, we've seen so many yes. other examples yes. in terms of the public sector in relation to uh, health and hospitals. And uh, I think that we should learn from that uh, and that we should look to reflect and think of a mechanism that assists that process, whether it's a board or not, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. uh, not certain on. I've got um, Margaret Mitchell followed by Alison, please. In the last session, then, we heard that COSLA very much welcomed the community focus when the consultation was there, but um, they were under the impression the national body would be supporting the, the 32 local um, bodies. And then we seem to move to a partnership, and then there's been a little bit of um, concern that the national body might be a little too powerful. And I know also from Police Scotland's uh, written submission, there's some concern over ministers appearing to retain wide influence over the national body and um, just what exactly would be involved in section shift and the direction guidance. Now, given these, um, these concerns, Dim Ailish had uh, suggested an, inspector, uh, an inspectorate, which you probably heard didn't seem to find much favour with the last panel, but some kind of independent scrutiny, your views on that would be uh, very much welcome. I suspect everybody will have a strong view on this. Um, I, my, my personal view actually mirrors the previous panel. Um, I think we have um, got um, plenty of very good inspection bodies um, and we are well experienced now in joint inspections. Um, and, and I think actually they bring a richness and a broader perspective to inspection than a single agency, for example, just looking at the community justice purist element to that, if it was a broad inspection regime involving prison service inspectorate, police inspectorate, social work inspectorate and, and various others, I think you would get a really rich picture and of course with Audit Scotland bringing uh, its own particular perspective into that. I don't think it's beyond the wit of us to actually work with that and, and to actually really benefit from it. that immediately uh, and Damien Leish did say we have an inspector at prisons we have that yeah. or if it would have been helpful almost like an independent arbiter Audit Scotland has been talked of maybe performing that function but I wonder if anyone had explored looking at how the balance could be struck by an independent um, source to ensure there weren't abuses to make sure there was a local flexibility that is intended through the community bill to make sure that prevention an early intervention was in there rather than concentrating on, on criminal justice. My, my view is that actually a joint inspection with the foresaid bodies would be the best way of achieving that. I'm going to be in the no camp. I, I think there's significant uh, public sector inspection bodies. I think there is an issue around uh, in terms of how we manage the outcomes, how well that we are collectively uh, delivering on those outcomes and how well individual organisations are delivering on those outcomes. 
some of that will come from the governance structure around those, those local partnerships and some of it will come from the, the objectives already established by Community Justice Scotland. If I may also uh, just kind of make comment on the first part of your question, which was around the, the balance or the imbalance in relation to a local versus uh, national model. Well, I would take the view that the, the actual bill as it stands is, is very kind of uh, imbalanced around the responsibilities and the uh, objectives of the, the national model. And it appears in some respects somewhat balanced by the explanatory memorandum that comes along with it at section 105, where it talks much less of monitoring and almost, a, a, almost an associated negative set of activities around outcomes to a much more supportive relationship between Community Justice Scotland. And I would certainly uh, wish a, a degree of balance uh, in the bill or in uh, statutory guidance that is uh, articulated in the activities proposed at section 105, which is generally, uh, rather than reading all of that section out, which is generally around about using Community Justice Scotland's skills and experience to support and develop uh, local practice and initiative. I think if we are able to reflect that in the bill, that gives an appropriate balance between what is helpfully articulated as, as, a, as a some objectives of a national body. But clearly, I, I, I think there's a balance required around the type of activities that it undertakes. In the bill itself again, Mr McKendrick, section 3, subsection 1c, it says of Community Justice Scotland to promote and support, yes, yeah. which isn't direct. It's promote and support improvement in the quality and range of provision of community justice. Mm. Does that not satisfy you that the word support is there? It does. I, I, I guess there's an illustration between the distinction between the memorandum, which is evidently by its nature much more detailed, but it, it provides a, a much more collegiate uh, perspective around about uh -huh. this. Except the bill's what counts at the end of the day, yeah. Um, Ms Methurst. To reflect and um, agree with the point that um, Grant Manders made regarding inspections. The inspectorates are um, very well established and um, already conduct thematic inspections as well as inspections of services. Um, so in terms of proposing a remit and scoping and outcomes, um, I think it's something that jointly they would be able to do. That's a loss to you, Margaret. There, that one's <laughs> lost. Yeah. You've tested it. You've tested it to death. That's fine. Well, Alison, to be followed by Margaret Wigwell. Alison, just perhaps following on from what Miss McKendrick said there. Um, Miss Medhurst said the government had consulted on the proposal from Angelini, which was this national agency, um, and, and, and come to a conclusion that the bill was the most appropriate way forward. We heard in the previous panel that the. Um, community justice authorities felt it was the least bad kind of local national compromise and that it was too much of a fudge. And I wonder if the panel um, would give me their views on whether or not it is just a compromise too far or whether it is the most appropriate way forward in balancing local and national tendencies. Yes, no, please. No, no, I'd rather have you in silence. I don't take that badly, Mr no. McKendrick. There we are. Hey. I'll not take it badly. Uh, in relation to is it a compromise, well, I'm not really sure I, I, I could support the word compromise. I, I think I've reflected previously on both the surprise and indeed kind of professional disappointment that it's not enshrined within the, uh, or it's not, the, the proposals are not integrated within the responsibilities for community planning partnerships. Uh, and I think that that is, is a major uh, error in relation to this. And I'll maybe just take the opportunity uh, to explain why I think it's a major error. We talked around about the requirements, or we talked about the, the complexities of individuals who offend in their set of circumstances. Restricting uh, the responsibility for community justice planning to the, the nominations within the, the bill in of itself actually doesn't uh, create the synergies that's developed through the community planning partners. So, for example, uh, there are significant people missing here, notwithstanding uh, the legal uh, professional terms of the, the Crown Office, but services that are actually very helpful uh, to families. So earlier intervention services, the third sector, and services associated with housing are all services that appear to be missed. So I'm not really sure that I could agree with the word compromise, but I think I would say that there's a missed opportunity not to cement uh, the activities that we would associate in delivering good outcomes for those people who are involved in the justice system uh, and not connecting them into uh, community planning partnerships. I think that that's a missed opportunity. Yes, Ms. Nettars. 
think from um, an SPS perspective, um, I said um, earlier in my opening that um, having that broader range of partners at the table is absolutely very welcome um, because we know that those transitions back into communities, um, individuals who have gone through a transition whilst in custody made that journey um, and have made some very positive changes in their lives, then return and find difficulty accessing not criminal justice services necessarily, but those broader range of services, um, which are much more difficult. So I think from that perspective, having the national, from a national organisation, obviously we will come at it with a national perspective, but providing that local um, perspective, which has a much broader um, in, um, engagement um, right across the community, will definitely, can, uh, we think, improve outcomes for those moving back into custody. Margaret McDougall, please. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask the same question as I did of the, the earlier uh, witnesses. Third sector, there is, it's very light, the spill on uh, actually including the third sector in this. And I just wondered what the, the panel's views are on that. And also, do you feel that offenders, families and victims are uh, adequately represented within the bill? Yes, Ms. Meadows. Okay. Um, in relation to um, the first question, um, which I've just forgotten. Third sector. Third sector, sorry. <laughs> um, I think the point that was made earlier, third sector is incredibly important. We work with third sector as well. But the difficulty is that across Scotland, what is provided in local communities differs quite considerably. And because it differs quite considerably and it's local services that have been developed for local needs, then I think it is difficult to, to ask them to engage in any meaningful way because they don't have the resource or the support to do it. And it's, it's about how, how it's done in a community sense or in a national sense that we um, engage them but recognise and reflect the fact that they are there and they do provide that, that support because I know that it is critical um, in, in the work that's done locally. So third sector um, is absolutely a key partner in um, most of the work that we are developing in prisons and we always engage with them um, and work um, as positively as we can, recognising the role that they play, not necessarily so much whilst the individuals in custody, but certainly coming up to release and then on, on release. So we do have um, strong linkages, but I do think there are difficulties around about what they are able to deliver and the fact that they're not national bodies and that they um, are local um, by their very nature. Um, I think from a sort of families, victims and um, the offenders perspective, um, certainly from, from a Scottish Prison Service perspective in relation to the journey that we're on um, in organisational change, looking at desistance in the asset based model, um, our focus very much is around about um, engaging with the individual themselves, with their families, um, but obviously always respecting the rights of the victims. Um, and I think it's how we do that in a constructive way when we um, are working with somebody during their sentence and then that transition back into the community again. I'm oh yes, Dr Foster. Uh, thank you. So, so the question was about the importance of the, involving the voluntary sector uh, and also the role of families. Um, and, and we'll give sufficient cognizance to um, the families of the offenders and the victims yes. of those offenders. Yes. Okay. So, so the roots of offending behaviour run really, really deep and they engage all of our different organisations around the community planning table. So it starts with early years and interventions, it runs through schooling and how we support people through school, it runs through the positive destinations after school and so on. So we all carry responsibility for that and that's why the community planning partnerships are actually a really good place to do this. From my experience of setting up a family support hub at Cornton Vale Prison, the people that we needed to engage to do that were the community planning partners. So again, I think there's a huge opportunity here to use that community planning focus to actually engage the public and the communities in this, in this work. 
I think the voluntary sector are absolutely a, a vital participant. And one of the good things, certainly in our local area, is that we have the voluntary sector at the community planning table. Um, and we need to emphasize that. And so I, I do think that's a very positive step. And, and a third factor is actually there are other agencies at that table who wouldn't naturally be at a separate table or in a different discussion. For example, uh, a strong partner for us locally in our partnership is Forth Valley College, um, who would clearly be, you know, play a really important role in supporting this and trying to reduce the offending and reoffending pattern. So I think we've got a lot of potential to use the existing community planning structures to nail the voluntary sector engagement, but also community engagement, because we're actively trying to strengthen the community engagement in community planning partnerships right now. Yes, no. Uh, yep. I can't read your writing anymore. You're getting tired. <laughs> Mr. McKendrick. Uh, I don't think it, 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 the bill does give uh, enough prominence to the, the vital and very important role that uh, the third sector plays in the delivery of community justice interventions. I mean, it, it's fairly straightforward. It's, it's the sparsely mentioned in relation to the bill in itself. Uh, so I think that the answer is pretty clear. Maybe the other question that follows from that is, is, is the question around about, well, why isn't it? I think earlier submissions actually reflected at least some of the points I'm going to make is, is that uh, it's, they're very diverse as a third sector. Uh, they can provide national services as well as, and appropriately so, locally defined services to bespoke uh, subsections of uh, those individuals that are involved within the justice system. So it's a complex picture. Uh, and we need to do more to make that more coherent both from a national perspective and a local perspective, but it's complex for those very reasons. Some of it is also down to the commissioning set of arrangements and how well uh, partnerships are using strategic commissioning principles. Uh, and in addition to that, some of it is also down to the nature, uh, certainly in relation to the Section 27 funding of that being annual and the capacity to third sector organisations to bring resilience to their organisations is impacted by at least some form of the funding that's available to them. In relation to, to families uh, and uh, victors and uh, individuals involved in the justice system themselves, there's, very, uh, there's no mention again uh, of, of those individuals. I, I'll take you back, arguably, to the definition of uh, the, the bill in relation to what community justice is. If we were thinking about broadly articulating the bill as is articulated in the policy memorandum, which is much broader, the issue around the impact on uh, victims, uh, individuals involved in the system themselves and families would be encompassed in that. So I, I, I think very strongly, uh, for a number of reasons, that, that, that those constituent members uh, should be greater reflected within the bill. And that is in part due to the rather narrow, narrow definition is, that I've uh, articulated earlier. Well, Margaret, yes, uh -huh. just on that point, I think we all recognise how important the third sector is, and the answer usually is, well, they're represented on community planning partnerships, but there is some concern that's very much top down. There may only be one voice there, and that there isn't the direct link that um, there needs to be for funding for, all, for various um, third sector organisations like, you know, circle or open secret that goes into Conton Vale. Um, so how do the panel feel about that? Would com community planning partnerships tick the box for you or does there need to be a more explicit mention of third sector organisations? I, I think it would be useful um, for the, the bill or act to be pretty clear that there needs to be a duty to have the right uh, third sector agencies involved at, at the community planning aspects of this. And the reason I say that is it may have been covered in, in the first session, but it's probably worth repeating anyway. Um, normally on community planning partnerships, it's some, somebody representing the third sector interface uh, who will not necessarily be a member of a third sector body that understands this agenda, um, who, who attends a strategic community planning partnership. And I, and I think it's important that we do get people to the table that understand this agenda when we're talking about community justice matters. So I, it would be very useful to do that. And I think just, to, just as a kind of a, a, a secondary issue, but again, I think it's, it's an important point. Sean mentioned uh, strategic commissioning there. I think it's important to recognise as well that there are a lot of um, examples across Scotland where community planning partnerships and local authorities have joined together 
um, for the commissioning of some of these third sector bodies. And I think that's something that ought to be encouraged. Uh, for example, you know, if North Ayrshire's got X service, uh, it would be a good idea if it shared it with South Ayrshire and vice versa. Um, and, and that way we would, we would end up with a virtuous circle. And, and I think, you know, there are good examples around Scotland, but it would be useful if not the bill, but certainly the strategy sitting around it. Was it clear about the, what we could do around that? I was going to come round um, and just take a last round up from you all of one thing, as I did with the previous panel, one thing you would like to change in the bill or add to the bill, just one thing if I was to put you um, on your metal there and say what would you put in or take out or what? One thing, just one. In a word, it would be prevention, but the reason for that has already been mentioned. It sits around... Uh, the issues around short-term prisoners and stuff like that. I think we're right. well provided for with longer term. Early intervention. Early intervention. Right. Intervention. I nearly asked you, Alison, what you would no, like, but no, you'll no, get your no, chance no. another time. Mr Watts. Um, I suppose as a, as a judicial agency, our role in this is limited, but I think I would ask for some kind of duty for full exchange of information about an individual among partners so that, that can be made available to decision makers, be that a court, uh, the fiscal, or, or a parole tribunal. It's not available just now. It could be an awful lot better. I think I'd like to expand that, maybe in writing, if we've got time to explain data protection issues, perhaps. Um, well, not yes. just now. Um, Dr Foster. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, I have two, so I'll need to be quite clever and try and make them one. You say you've got one, it's in two parts. That's what politicians That's what we do. say. Thank you. I've learned something today. I mean, thank I shouldn't have much. to tell you these things. But... I, I have one reply. It's in two parts. <laughs> um, the first is, I think, we were talking about how you measure. Uh, um, and I think it's really, really important that we find some way in the bill to talk about positive destinations and jo not just the negative measures. So we shouldn't be measuring reoffending rates. We need to measure individuals going into employment or other positive destinations. I think that would make a huge difference to the way this lands. Um, and the second one was just picking up on the discussion. The landscape is very, very complicated. The NHS, even as a large public sector body, struggles to already manage to attend all the different partnerships and organisations. So anything we can do to keep it simple and keep the number of organisations simple will help all of us and will especially help people like the voluntary sector bodies and so on who want to come to the table. So try and keep it simple, try and build on existing mechanisms rather than create new ones. Thank you. Mr McKendrick. So on the basis You've not got one point in yeah. three parts, have you, Bill? <laughs> well, it's opened uh, up the gates there. No, for timing, I, I might just make the one point <laughs> that, uh, that, you, that you suggested. But on the basis of forum follows function, I think that we really need to look at what the definition is. I, I think if you get a broader definition uh, with the, the, the clarity that picks up some of the discussion around about inclusion, uh, you, you'd have a much better bill. Ms Meadhurst. You just stole my thunder. Um, it, it is, there, there is to be, a, I think, a further working definition of, of community justice. Um, and it's really important that that definition gives clear parameters so that we have got um, absolute clarity about the continuum of service for offenders, both within community and custody. Mr. Uh, I have two parts, although it's on a continuum. So yes, I have all. <laughs> hey, you're embellishing it now. Yes. Uh, first part, just as I mentioned earlier on, it's not so much changes to the bill, but clarification in relation to the delineation of roles and functions between the new body and also our own organisation would be welcome. Um, I think what we mentioned in our submission was also there is reference in relation to the MAPA annual reports been uh, subject to review by the Community Justice Scotland, but it's unclear, I think, within the bill as to what function the Community Justice Scotland body is taking in relation to does it have responsibility and oversight of those MAPA arrangements. So okay. some further clarification within the bill would be welcome now. Well, thank, thank you all very much. Um, and uh, we very much enjoyed this evidence session. Again, it's very useful. And I'll just suspend for a minute, stay put, team, uh, to let witnesses leave, because we've got another item on the agenda.
Moving quickly on to item three, it's consideration of five negative instruments. The Scottish Government says that the purpose of all five instruments is to move toward fees that reflect the full cost of the processes involved with some fee exemptions to protect access to justice. The first is adults with incapacity public guardians fees, Scotland Regulations 2015. Uh, these make provision for the fees payable to public guardian in Scotland. The DPLR committee considered this instrument at its meeting on 1st September and agreed that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do members have any comment? No. Are, members, are members content to make no recommendation? Okay. Thank you. The second negative instrument we are considering today is the Court of Session Fees Order 2015. This makes provision for the fees payable to the Court of Session, the Principal Clerk of Session, the Accountant of Court and the Auditor of the Court of Session or any officer acting for one of those officers. The DPLR Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on 1st September 2015 and agreed that it did, it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do members have any comments in relation to this instrument? Thank you. I've lost the other two. I've got it. Here we are. Uh, the third negative instrument we are considering today... Are members, are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? And my apologies. The third negative instrument we are considering today is the High Court of Justiciary Fees Order 2015. This makes provision for the fees payable to the High Court of Justiciary, to the Principal Clerk of Justiciary, or any other officer acting for the Principal Clerk. The DPLR Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on 1st September 2015 and agreed that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do members have any comments? Nope. Are members content to make no recommendation? Yep. The fourth instrument is the Justice of the Peace Court Fees Scotland Order 2015. This makes provision for the fees payable in Justice of the Peace Courts in Scotland to the Clerk of the Justice of the Peace Court. The DPLR Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on 1st September 2015 and agreed that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do you have any comments in relation to the instrument? Are you alive out there? Yes. 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 No. Are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? The fifth and final instrument today is the Sheriff Court Fees Order 2015. This order makes provision of the fees payable in the Sheriff Court to the Sheriff Clerk or the Auditor of Court. The DPLR Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on 1st September 2015 and agreed that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do members have any comments on this instrument? No. Are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? Our next meeting will take place on the 22nd of September when we will take evidence of the Community Justice Scotland Bill, consider amendments to the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill at Stage 2 and look at our ongoing petitions. In relation to the Criminal Justice Bill, we will be going no further than the end of Part 6. We will consider amendments and stop and search and powers of arrest at a later meeting. I also want to say I've asked, I'm going to ask Spice for a briefing on the Community Empowerment Bill, which seems to interact so much with the Community a justice bill that we have, and I think that would be quite useful for us, you know, to have an idea about that one, which is processing. It's your local government, is it? No, it's gone. We passed it. It's gone. Oh, it's passed. passed. Oh, there, that went past <laughs> me in a flash. But I think we need to know more the, the interaction because they seem to relate to each other considerably. Thank you very much. That's the end of the meeting. Closed.